Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Should we start? OK, this is a uh, map archi. Um, we have a, one half, a two and a half hour slot and a lot of presentations. So let's start right away. Um, unfortunately, Dave is not here this time. Um, but I think he might be rejoining joining remotely at some point, so we'll see. Um, we have also a note on intellectual property rights in the IRTF here, uh, very similar to the note well in the IETF, so you might be familiar with it. Um, in the slides, uh, there are a couple of links to the Jabber room, to the mailing list, and everything you need to know. Um, but given you probably already have found the slides, you might already know where that is. Okay, before we actually start with our agenda, as we usually do, and we have a lot of nice presentations today, um, I would like to quickly talk about the IAB review we had at the last IETF meeting. So um, every uh, research group gets like reviewed from time to time by the IAB to have some kind of feedback mechanism uh, discuss how to de develop the, the group and see like if it makes sense to continue. Um, we had our very first um, review with the IAB and in general this was, was very positive. So um, they all kind of liked it, but we also discussed about how to develop the group into certain directions. Because what we do right now, because that's kind of the feedback we got from the beginning from the group, is we focus very much on measurement results, getting people from academia presenting measurement results, and then kind of you can consume this information and talk to the people and, and get a connection there. So what we do in more, in more detail is that we usually try to solicitate contributions from academia or also industry research. Uh, we did so by going to different um, conferences. Whenever like Dave or I happen to be at a conference, we try to announce that MAPRG exists and people should send contributions. Uh, we also had some lightning talks which were like explicitly on the agenda and these kind of things. Um, we use uh, we, we we create something that we call uh, uh, that we call a call for contributions, which looks a little bit like a call for papers for a conference. And we send this call for contributions not only to our own mailing list but also to different um, academia conference mailing list where usually this call for papers gets announced. And of course, a lot of the presentation you see here is really direct uh, interactions with like presentation day for I have seen somewhere and we liked a lot and we think it's in scope. So we go and we send those people an email, we talk to them at a conference and ask them to come here if possible. Um, the way we select the contributions is mainly driven really by the charter. So the first check is always is a contribution in charter. And then we also um, prefer uh, presentations that provide data over a presentation that only talk about methodology or something because that's kind of the feedback I think we got from this group. Um, we in general try to fit as much contributions into the agenda as possible. Um, 
but it's also sometimes a logistic question. So usually we try to prefer uh, in-person presentation over remote presentation, just so that you also have a chance to interact with the speaker after the session or during the whole week. Um, or sometimes it's just like, this person can only present at a European meeting or just present as at a US meeting, so we have to figure out if we do it this time or next time or whatever. What we really try to avoid is um, having any presentations in here that are presented in other working groups that can still be interesting, but usually we have enough presentations, so we think it would be unfair to give time to somebody who already has a slot somewhere else. And we also um, really um, prefer presentations which are kind of newish or uh, cannot be discovered somewhere else. Like if there's a video of your presentation, then we might, and we don't have time for you, then we might like maybe decide for a different presentation. Um, what we really liked is that we had a couple of presentations where we kind of scooped the conference itself, so the presentation was before the final presentation at the conference. Um, and then another step we do is that uh, when we have the agenda selected, we try to get slides um, very early from the presenters so we can give them feedback and, and, and try to guarantee a high quality. And I think actually, and sometimes we give them feedback or request changes or whatever, but it doesn't happen very often because just like forcing people to send everything early and 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 kind of warning them that you want to like feed, give them feedback or, or have change requests already kind of gives us, us a very high quality of presentations. So that's what we do. Any questions on that part? And that's also kind of what we presented to the IAB and what came out of this um, meeting was a couple of ideas, what we could maybe change or improve. And I want to quickly just like, it's all written on the slides and maybe you have ideas or we can also discuss this later, but like uh, give an overview for you. So there was one idea to, instead of having one, so we never requested more than one session because we thought like two and a half hours is already a lot and we don't want to take away more of the IETF meeting time basically. But uh, there was an idea to maybe split up into two smaller sessions, so it's easier to deconflict. Um, I've been, dis been considering this this time, or we both, Dave and I, considered it this time, but it's actually hard because we don't get the contributions very early, so we don't really know how to deconflict, right? At the point of time where the agenda scheduling is done, we don't know that yet. Another question that came up in the review is like, do we actually get uh, the right people in the room, which is like related to the first question, right? Does everybody know if there is a presentation here that is relevant to their own uh, work that the presentation happens and do they actually come? Um, we had like, because the room is usually very full, we had a feeling that M uh, MapRG is well known, but of course we can do more. We can send like more emails to mailing lists. We could send emails to the chair mailing lists so the chairs can judge if it's relevant for the working group or not. Um, so. Yeah, any input is welcome here. Aaron. Is it okay to talk about this now? Yeah. Uh, Aaron Falk. So um, one thing I recently did uh, in TAPS was uh, do a reset on the conflict list. Um, and so what you might do is send a message out to the list asking for people who wanted to be here but couldn't because of a conflict. And then you can, you know, maybe get some new entries for your list. But I guess that depends really on the presentations we have. <laughs> if, if you wanted to be here or not, right? which again is something we don't know by the time where the scheduling is done. Uh, yeah. There are certainly going to be some people who will only come because of a specific presentation, but I think there are people maybe who are interested in the topic who want to monitor the general effort, but um, uh, yeah. you know, are just in a recurring conflict. That happens yeah. you know, from time to time in tabs. We can give it a try, definitely. Spencer's in the queue. You ready for me? Yes. Uh, I was just going to say that another way to, to understand what Mary is saying is often in the IETF, we don't know what the agenda is going to look like until two weeks, basically until the ID uh, submission cut off. But here, you guys know what research you know, you've done and what results you've got potentially a long time before, two weeks before the ITF meeting. So you might be able to give Miria more of a heads up so that she could not have to struggle so hard with a conflict list. So Spencer, actually we don't. Like this time we really uh, knew which presentations are in at the time where the draft gender, gender deadline was requested um, because it's, it's 
maybe we started too late to, to ask for contributions, but people are also deadline driven, right? Whenever you put a deadline, you get all contributions at the deadline. <laughs> so, and then like, even after the deadline, we were still so, so, uh, going to people and, and trying to talk to them and, and figure out what they want to present. And there was a lot of forth and back. So it's, it's actually, it would be nice, but it's, it wasn't the case for the last couple of meetings. I have a dream. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Colin. Hi, Colin Perkins. Um, so, so I don't think this has been a problem, but I think it's something we should look at going forward is that we're, we're getting increasing amounts of research group uh, you know, me measurement research coming into the ATF uh, with things like the ANRW and the, the ANRP. And, uh, we, we, we should um, make sure that there's a clear story for, for where this research goes uh, and where it's presented. Um, yeah, we, we don't want to be having the same talk several times. No, so Maybe I mean, definitely. So we had actually this case that um, somebody who presented at the workshop on Monday also um, a while ago actually uh, submitted a contribution to us and we knew that this was coming up and so we didn't have that presentation. So that's something that we definitely try to avoid. How to redirect people to the right group is actually kind of more difficult because not everybody at the workshop is interested in the rest of the IETF, right, in these kind of things. So. Yeah. We also, I mean, it's also like sometimes we have a lot of contributions and sometimes we don't. It really also depends on the location. Like in Europe, we get, for example, a lot of contributions. In Asia, we get less. There are many factors. Yeah, I mean, th this is pr probably just a case of um, you know, g giving people some guidance for, for what the venues are in the ITF um, for this type of work and where, yeah. where they should be thinking. It, it's it's coordination between the different efforts is definitely, but like you can only give guidance as soon as people show up. <laughs> Um, another idea that uh, we liked a lot and Dave might um, uh, proceed a little bit more is to organize a measurement related hackathon um, session. Um, we don't know what that means yet. If we just say like, if you want to do something on measurement, come to this table. Or if we actually think about like very specific project where we say like, we want to hack on this measurement tool. We want to run like this kind of small measurement study today and then see if people are interested. So. Um, if you're interested in, in contributing to that part or you have ideas what you would like to do at the hackathon, please talk to us. Um, another thing that was discussed was, and, and that was discussed in this working group at the very beginning, is how do we get actually hands on the data? How can we make sure that uh, all the data that is presented is available for further um, research and analysis? And how can we uh, support this kind of uh, data exchange as this group. Um, I think that was kind of also the, the main motivation why we started this whole effort at the very beginning, but like we very quickly understood that getting data at hand is also not easy in a lot of cases. And we had the feeling that people are happy with kind of getting these presentations and then getting directly with those people in touch and see if they can do something further. But of course, we could also do a little bit more effort and try to figure out like put in, in the wiki, for example, where this data is available, which data, or let everybody who um, presents fill out a template and tell us about the data, what kind of data do you have, what format, how much data, how, where to find it, these kind of things. Would there be interest in this kind of um, effort? Nobody at the mic, but you can send me an email if you want. Um, then another point that came up was like, um, do we do we want to connect? Do we want to use this group to connect to the operators community? Um, and there is a, a group at, at the right meeting for for example that's called MET that's also focused on measurements. Um, so we could uh, try, kind of try to like more closely work with them together. Um, but I have to say, like, I'm actually not certain, certain about that point because, first of all, our charter says we're targeted for IETF meetings. And second is, given we have this mode where we kind of present data, I don't think there's something where you can, like, a lot of, do a lot of common work because it's just a forum for discussion. Brian, who is the MET chair. Hi, Brian Drammel, right, at WG, co-chair. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the right way to do it. I mean, like, you know, we... We talk occasionally, you and I, uh, and uh, the meeting cycles don't line up, uh, you know, in such a way that there's much conflict. So, um, yeah, if there's stuff that's here that I think should also go to ripe, I will um, approach people and, uh, you know, vice versa. So uh, I think that there's, you know, a lot of the stuff that's here is 
I mean, they're, they're slightly different focuses, right? Like, so the mat stuff is things that are, are, are meant to be a little bit more operationally relevant, but also things that are sort of, you know, even just interesting. Um, so yeah, I have one of the reasons I'm here and I cover this is looking for interesting things to encourage to come to Matt. So. Yeah, so I mean, like this one is easy because you're sitting in the same office, but maybe there are other groups <laughs> that are focused on measurements uh, and I'm not aware of. So if you like involved or you know of these groups, let me know. We can see if that makes sense to um, cooperate. <clears throat> and then a very last point was um, also that like some of these presentations might be interesting for an IETF blog post. So in general, we see like more posts um, on the IETF blog. And I already did this and, and talked to some of uh, the people who presented the last time and they will write a blog post. Um, so if you are presenting or you have some data that you think is interesting and you would like to write a blog post, just come to me. And if you write a blog post, you get a free t-shirt. Didn't know that. Ooh. Okay, um, any comments, further ideas, discussions? No, you're all waiting for the presentations, okay. That's the agenda for today. Um, so we have uh, um, two head-up talks, and both are more focused on, on tools and methodologies and on measurement data, that's why they're head-up talks, because as I said earlier, we are like trying to focus more on the actual data. Uh, and then we have six talks um, all over the place. So it's like, it's about privacy, IPv6, DNS, uh, packet sizes, so the typical stuff we are interested. So let's start. Um, Giovanni, where are you? There. You want to try, is that connected? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, so good morning, everybody. Uh, so this is a heads up talk, it's just a five minute one. This is a paper we have presented at TMA conference in Vienna. Uh, it's a tool and allows you to do, to automate measurements related to domain name. So, um, one, one situation we face at SIDN, it is like if you wanted to measure a lot of properties associated to a domain name, let's say wikipedia.org, if you wanna know um, stuff like where the DNS services are located, information about SMTP, HTTP, where it's hosted. It's very hard to do that with current tools. There's a bunch of open data sets, but currently there's no tool that do that automatically for you. So if you wanna measure all these different protocols associated with any domain name, we would end up to have something like that. Uh, you have to use ZMAP, DIG, Mask, and a bunch of other tools. You can do it, but it ain't pretty, and that's a problem because you end up wasting a lot of time doing repetitive tasks you have to deal with very different data formats. You waste, again, a lot of time. Um, more complexity, as we know, leads to more errors. And it's very hard, as if you're an academic reviewer, to review papers and try to reproduce those studies because you're gonna be wasting a lot of time in just doing the measurements. So what we decided to do is to build a new tool. It's called DMAP, Domain Name Ecosystem Mapper. And what it does is just automate the measurements of five protocols and also take a screenshot of a domain name, of a website that exists. And what it, the way it works is different from ZMAP. ZMAP, usually you have a list of IP addresses already just generated for you, but this one you have to provide a CSV um, with a list of domain names. It can be Zonfi as we use for .NL, which is almost six million domain names. And in a single machine, we do one million domains a day, but this application is also distributed, so you can scale up very quickly and easily. This is the website. Um, let me see. Uh, there's a bunch of... Uh, stuff in the paper, applications, demos, whatever, and SQL code to analyze that. Oh yeah, the good thing about this tool is that later, once you, they do, the tool do, does all the measurements, it's very easy for a researcher just to analyze the results using SQL. So we have a demo data set on the website, it's like 1 million. Uh, the queries are there, you can download and analyze. And I just wanna show one thing. Uh, this is a table um, that shows the various properties that we have measured using Alexa. And one thing we found is that uh, currently on Alexa 1 million, 70% of all the domains support HTTPS and one in five are using Let's Encrypt. There's way more, there are many more findings in the paper. Um, just would like to encourage you to download. Uh, only thing we, the only thing we make is like we make it only open source for researchers because this has some kind of a commercial uh, application possibility, so we just don't want to incentivize that. So just click on it to have to register. We're gonna give you the access to the repository and GitHub and that's it. Thank you very much.
Uh, we actually ahead of schedule, so there, there could be questions. Oh, yeah. But I guess we just no. move on. So we just have to leave the mic here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So I'm going to give you a key overview about monitoring DNS with open source solutions. This was presented on the SRE Connect in American. Well, so uh, DNS is currently monitored in two different ways. One is doing a pre data aggregation, and uh, we, that is done by aggregating all the information onto the DNS server and then sending it into a central server for the visualization. Uh, this method is used by stuff like DSC that was developed by ORC, and we also have DNS data that is used by the root servers. The second method is doing the disaggregating data sending and storing, storage it, like storing the raw package of the DNS. This method is used by Entrada, for example, that uses a Hadoop cluster to process and store all the information. Now, the problem with this method is that it doesn't give too much information about the current status of the DNS server. So we started looking about how we could improve this, the, the current methods. And for this, we first tried to develop our own solution. We developed Rata DNS that did, did the capture, storage, and visualization of all the data. But we, we saw that we were uh, reinventing the wheel. Many of the things that we were developing were already done by someone else. And also, when we presented this to the DNS administration, they found that it was like too wide, they didn't like it. <laughs> so we start looking to open source solutions. Uh, we saw that many of the problems that we were presenting were already done by someone, where are they done in production. And we start analyzing different software for the capture, storage, and visualization. For the capture, we, saw, we use we compare different software like Packetbit, Collective, DSC, and we saw that many of them didn't support all the transport or network protocols that DNS use. So in this case, we had to develop our own solution that was DNS sampling, which captured all the information and sent them to a central database for the processing. We also compare a DNS benchmark of the different storage, like Prometheus, Druid, ClickHouse, InfluxDB, Elasticsearch, and PTSDB. And we also compare the different visualization software. Finally, we end up with an architecture like this, where we had the DNS servers, and we capture all the information. We are own solution that was DNS sampling. All the information was sent to a ClickHouse cluster. And finally, it was presented in a Grafana visualization. Uh, the result was something like this, where we have, for example, top query domains that some information that was never analyzed directly in real time. Uh, we also have the unique domains names that are query per second, for example, the average packet size and the total packet size. We also have some general information like the query type, query class, and everything that the other software already get, provides. Uh, some of the performance on the single server setup, uh, we tested with real data from the NIC Chile. And we found that is, we could process like 7,000 packet per second, and we found that it used 34 gigabytes of data, and we could store that in 4.7 gigabytes every day. So it's, it's entirely possible to run in, run in like, and store like a year of data or more. And we also tried to flood our own servers. It was a pretty fun experiment. And we found that we can handle like 120,000 packets per second on one single server. And the database ne never go up on more than 30% of the CPU. And this was like a two-course computer, so it's, it can scale a lot more. So this is what the presentation of my tool, and when monitoring DNS servers, thanks. Thank you, any quick questions? Yeah, somebody coming, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, John Reed, Akamai. Um, sorry, I mi maybe I missed where you were capturing packets from, from recursives, from authoritatives, from both? Where uh, it was the authoritative DNS servers of Chile, the CCTLD of .cl. The authoritative end. Hmm? So the authoritative servers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you, did you 
consider or have any insight in gathering data from recursive servers? I know one of the challenges is we can monitor what the authoritators are giving back. That doesn't tell us anything about the end user experience. You can monitor whatever you want. Uh, we only capture directly for the, from the wired package. Right. So you can store anything, whatever you want. Okay. Sarah Dickinson, could you say a little bit more about the format you're using to capture the data? Are you capturing full PCAPs or a reduced set of data? Uh, what we capture is the entire data, uh, the entire uh, package, and we just extract what we need. For example, we extract the domain names we're querying, the type, class, and uh, that is what we store in the ClickHouse database. There is a draft going through DNS op at the moment, which defines a DNS specific capture format using Seabor. Yeah. And I don't know if you're doing something similar or you decided not to use that for a, a specific yeah. for reason. For now, we, we don't use that format because <clears throat> it was like very early in the draft when we developed this tool. Um, um, well, with this architecture, you can actually swap, for example, the capture process and you store directly into the ClickHouse database and you can also use that. It's not a problem. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ian? Uh, so, uh, I have some recent data on UDP packet reordering that we're seeing in Quick. Um, so, obviously, I can't say whether this is representative of, uh, you know, what, what someone else might see. I can't say it's representative of TCP, but uh, at least for this data set, it's fairly representative. Um, it wasn't Chrome stable, so we're talking fairly large sample sizes, um, you know, millions of users and uh, many, many servers. Um, and we have some from the server side and some from the client side. Uh, the core metric is actually exactly the same and the measurement uh, code is exactly the same, uh, but it turns out the data does end up displaying a little bit differently and I apologize for that, that difference. Uh, makes it a little bit more difficult to interpret, but we'll walk through it anyway. Um, ah, so I probably should have just gone to this slide. Um, also, we're using BBR congestion control on the server side um, from server to client, but we are using cubic uh, from client to server. So that actually may affect the measurement data, uh, it may potentially change the likelihood of reordering. Um, also the client side data, um, which is, so client is the client receiving and it's measuring on the receive side and the server is sending. Um, so those flows tend to be longer. They're CDN flows in this particular case, like large uh, video playbacks, things like that. Um, the server side data tends to be, uh, you know, obviously less data intensive with a few exceptions. Um, so there's an inherent asymmetry, at least, in this, but it kind of reflects typical web traffic, so hopefully it's informative. Um, so the first fact is just how many percent of, what percent of connections have at least one reordered packet? Um, on the client side, it's only 5.4%. On the server, it's 9.4%. I, I can't really explain why there would be more reordering going upstream than downstream, personally. Maybe someone else can. Um, could be Wi-Fi because we can blame everything on Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, a big takeaway is, you know, 90% of connections see, like, no reordering whatsoever, right? So, like, if you're trying to optimize your loss recovery, like, maybe we should be optimizing, like, you know, for the, like, 90% first and then, like, ratchet up. So uh, this was certainly, I didn't expect it to be quite this stark, but this might be uh, even more motivation for, like, a more adaptive uh, scheme. And it certainly is motivation that, like, uh, the approximate scheme rack has chosen where it initially it uses packet number threshold and then drops over to time-based is, is pretty compelling. Um, so the remaining data excludes connections with no reordering because I don't really want to look at a bunch of like percentiles where everything's zero. Um, uh, so this is on the client side. So on Chrome, Chrome is receiving packets. Uh, and this is in packet number space. And this is actually pretty brutal and depressing. Um, so I had to put the bottom scale at a log scale because there's a still like a decent amount of energy around 100. Uh, and, um, and, and a thousand, I mean, I think we don't actually get to like point, under 0.1% until like a few hundred. Um, so things are pretty bad in a packet number space. Um, and in particular, as you can see, 10 is like a few percent right there. Um, 
So the default routering threshold of three is kind of woefully insufficient for something like half the time uh, when reordering actually does happen. So it's sort of, you know, you pick a number and you, you go with it, but it's, it's sort of a weird number. Um, things look a little bit, you, do you have a question? Sorry. Tommy Polly Apple, just clarifying question. On this last one, so this is of things that were reordered. Yes. Yeah, so this means is this like, both directions or this is only on the client side. So I'll okay. I'll go to the server side okay. data after. I'm going to do all the client side data and then all the server side data. Um, so uh, and I think this metric I can't remember if I have this metric on the on the server side or not. Um, yes. So on the client side, um, we also happen to record it as a fraction of min RTT. Um, so that's just kind of an indication of like if I was to do it in a time domain, what would it look like? Uh, and here it looks quite a bit quite a bit nicer. So you see, um, you know, there's almost no energy before 25 percent, or sorry, after 25 percent, except for that blip at the very end. Which um, this is running in user space, so I'm going to suspect that that's Chrome basically hanging for some long period of time and and thread janker or something like that. Um, so yeah, so this this looks quite nice. Like there's there's very little energy even past. 12.5%, uh, so so we're doing much better. Um, I did have to filter the min RTT to greater than 100 milliseconds to get this data to be like sensible. Um, it turns out that there are some clients that measure like sub millisecond RTTs, and obviously if you have a sub millisecond RTT, uh, your fraction of min RTT just kind of goes crazy. Um, it'd be interesting to get data for like greater than 10 milliseconds as well, which kind of is a more sensible thing. So. Um, the fact that it was so crazy, though, is probably motivation that we need a min. Like, if you're going to start using time-based loss detection, like, probably you need something that's on the order of, like, your clock granularity or your timer <laughs> granularity, like one millisecond, some amount of minimum threshold just to kind of ensure some basic sanity in the network. Did you? Yeah, uh, Aaron Falk. Um, I f I'm finding it hard to get any intuition around this without having some understanding of uh, um, how distributed this is over flows. Like, is this, do you have like one flow that has a lot of problems or is it kind of uh, spread out? And same thing so, for paths, same things, you know. Yeah, um, on the server side, I have the number of packets, I think, re reordered per flow as well. We'll get to that later. I don't have that on the client side. so. So this is the max time for a given flow. So this is not even the typical time, but this is um, this is an effort of saying if you if I had an adaptive kind of time based loss detection that like ratcheted up the time threshold to whatever was necessary to never spuriously retransmit a packet, kind of how much time of reordering window would I need to, to make that happen? That's my internal logic. Yeah, I guess it's just like when you uh, the like the PDFs that you're showing before when you're when you're showing like uh, numbers of events that you're measuring, is it is it conf do you uh, do you have like um, a single flow who has this multiple times, um, or a single path has it multiple times? I'm just trying to understand how pervasive uh, are the statistics. like. Is this a one-off event, or is it like? Yeah, is it localized? Is it clustered together uh, topologically? I, I can't give you I can't give you good information on that. I can give you some kind of knowledge from my experience with the, looking at packet traces, which is um, having like one packet race in front of a bunch of other packets is oddly common. Um, so I've observed that a fair amount for UDP. I don't know if that's a common thing with TCP. Um, and I assume it's a matter of uh, you overflow like one buffer on a, a switch or something and switches are heavily multi-threaded and you pop onto the other one and it has no queue. Uh, something like that. I'm not exactly sure. So um, so that phenomenon is common, but I, I can't kind of give you any more prevalence data than that. I know. Um, on the server side. Um, Here's the number that does actually give you a prevalence number, so I don't have this on the client side. Um, this is for connections that have reordering, how many were reordered. Um, and so it looks like, you know, in this case, there's a lot of energy, you know, around like in the in the sub-80 region. Um, that kind of makes sense. I mean, most of these flows are fairly short. Um, so, uh, and, and one fun fact is, yeah, 38% only had one packet out of order on the server side. So, um, that would say it's fairly rare overall in the scheme of things. Uh, here's it in percent. Um, so again, it's 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 fairly rare, but the, the distribution's a little bit shifted. Um, as I said, a lot of these flows are quite short on the server side. Um, 
So here's the kind of same thing, like the maximum gap in, in quick packet number. Here's the number that we're looking before on the client side. Uh, unfortunately, this is inverted distribution, so I have to kind of translate. Um, but as you can see, uh, the, the first kind of big plateau is one. Uh, so over 40% of packets were just like twiddles, as they are sometimes referred to as. Uh, and then you get a fair amount of energy around two and three. And then, um, you know, kind of things go off the, off the chart on the top end from there. Um, so it seems on the server side, the, the maximum distance and packet number is smaller. Uh, I think that's mostly a product of the fact that usually we have a smaller congestion window going from client to server than from server to client. I don't think it's, um, I could be wrong, but I don't think it's actually an inherent network property, unfortunately. Um, if we look at the same data, uh, fraction of min RTT, when your min RTT is greater than 100 milliseconds, um, should have swip, swapped these graphs around, but it looks pretty similar to the client side. It's pretty uh, heavily distributed towards, um, you know, the like un, under a quarter of a uh, min RTD. Um, so, the vast majority of connections see no reordering. Um, the tail is very, very long. Um, in packet number space, it's depressingly long. Um, Quick runs in user space, so you know small amounts of network reordering may occasionally get amplified into much larger amounts of network reordering due to like uh, thread jank, particularly true on the client side. Um, and so hopefully TCP actually might see a little bit less reordering if things are going well. Um, the one quarter RTT reordering threshold that is currently recommended in the quick recovery draft actually seems pretty sensible after looking at this data. Um, and it certainly seems like this is motivation for like an adaptive scheme because it seems like the vast, vast majority of connections could get away with uh, a very, very short reordering tolerance that maybe handled twiddles and nothing else initially and then uh, ratcheted it up to something more uh, aggressive later. At least those are my thoughts, but questions, comments? Eric Nigren, do you have a sense of what fraction of this um, of these are um, fragmented packets and whether fragmented packet reassembly might be leading to any of this? So we set the do not fragment bit, at least on the server side, and I believe on all client side platforms that uh, permit it, uh, which is not, at some point it wasn't Mac, but I don't know why. Anyway, um, yeah. So hopefully we're not getting fragments. I mean, the network does weird things. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins. Um, so I was actually surprised at how much reordering you were seeing. Um, I, I was expecting the numbers to be a lot less than this. Um, you, you said at the beginning that you blame Wi-Fi, and I suspect that's probably the case, but um, do, do you know that, or is that an assumption? I do not know that. Um, I mean, it's it's very difficult for me to, to piece things apart exactly like where these things happen, fortunately. Sure, sure. okay. Um, I, I guess my other question is, do you have any insight into uh, whether there are patterns of where in the connection the reordering happens. So is it always the first packet getting delayed, for example, or, or something like that? Um, based on looking at traces, my uh, the patterns that I, I see here is one is this, like you get this small packet that races ahead of a large packets. So that yeah. tends to happen at the tail of a response. So you right. get this long, so it happens when two things happen, when you build up queue pressure and then you send a small packet. So that combination, um, something, some portions of the internet seem to decide that that's that's a thing they should race ahead. And so, um, you know, if you don't have any queue pressure, then this, the small packet doesn't need to race ahead of anything. But like if you if you kind of, you sure. know, produced a few milliseconds of buffer bloat, then it'll sometimes race ahead. Yeah, okay. But but you're not seeing, for example, the first packet in a flow being delayed because it's I haven't seen that. Or something like that. I've heard okay. that is a potential, is it a, like 3G issue or something like that where the radio is firing up and maybe that's yeah. happening. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. that, that's good for connection establishments if that's not happening, so that's a good Yeah, I see, I see very little reordering in connection establishment. Um, good, typically. thank you. At least in my anecdote, yeah. Hi, uh, Brian Trammell. Um, anecdotally, um, we have, we would also blame Wi-Fi. I mean, so where we've, where we've done stuff for like in the lab, where we're looking at different um, connection things, it's always like the dodgy little um, uh, wireless router thing, and they suck if you come over um, if you come over the wired interface, but they suck a lot if you go over the wireless interface. So, um, you know, we have like one or two boxes that we've done. I mean, we weren't actually looking at reordering; we were looking at something else, and reordering messed up our stuff, right? And it was primarily on those boxes. So, yeah, let's blame Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Oh, do you, do you have a question? 
Gori Fairhurst, thank you. It's fun to have real reordering information. I wonder whether this is partly a function of what you measured. Um, the fact I see TCP having maybe having less reordering, maybe it's the function of your congestion controller actually pushing hard for a little while. So I, I wonder whether as a community we could kind of gather more stuff. And um, do, do you think that would be useful to kind of look at other other transports, other links, and see what we can actually derive from this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would love to see exactly comparative data for TCP in particular. It might be very difficult to actually keep, uh, gather due to GRO and various other kernel things that are helping us out. Um, but yeah, it'd be incredibly interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't say it was easy. I said it was interesting. <laughs> I mean, Google is still doing using, using, using TCP, right? So eventually come back, can come back with TCP data oh, yeah, at some point? Uh, yeah, you should, you, maybe you should ask Neil and Yu Chung about that. I, don't okay. know if I will. I will back them. Up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, maybe it, it might actually be possible. I, I I can try to see if I can coordinate with the teams. That would be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, please leave the clicker. <laughs> you want that back? Right. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Brian Trammell, uh, ETH. This is work I actually did with Miria, um, but she's chairing, so I'll present. Um, and we ask a very simple question, and we have a very simple answer. Is buffer bloat a privacy issue? Actually, I want to see. Uh, is buffer bloat a privacy issue, yes or no? So hands up for yes. Uh, hands up for no. Oh, yes. Buffer bloat has a potential privacy impact. Okay, that's interesting. But there's a big asterisk on this. Yes, everything's a privacy issue, right? Um, so if you have significant buffering on a link, right? So yeah, that's buffer bloat. Um, if you have a public IP address that is associated only with that link, if the public IP address is, responds to an ICMP echo request and that echo request and reply share the buffered queue, um, then I can ping you and figure out how big your queue is. This is very surprising to me. Um, so I decided to come and talk about it. Um, for networks that we examined, this is a, this is, I would almost call this anic data. This is a, a extremely biased study of people that I could get to clink on a link in a tweet. Um, but for one in seven of the networks there, um, these conditions hold. So this is actually, um, you know, advice we've been giving in the transport area for a long time is like fix buffer bloat, but now we can say actually no, seriously fix buffer bloat because this is a problem. How did we get here? Um, this is sort of a, a recap. Uh, I didn't actually um, set off to try and answer this question. I tried to answer a completely different question. So this was, um, you know, this is the quick portion of the morning, I guess. So uh, this was a question that was sent to the quick RTT design team um, in the spin bit discussions is RTT data privacy sensitive, passive RTT data privacy sensitive? And the idea is, um, yeah, if I can ping you, I can know where you are, not what you're doing. And, you know, you essentially do um, very simple trilateration. You know, the, um, uh, you uh, basically take the radius is equal to the time on each of these pings, multiply it by the speed of light in the internet, run, you know, do some very basic math. Um, and uh, actually it turns out that the, data is um, usually fuzzy enough that when you do this very basic math, you divide by zero somewhere. And if you're not dealing with complex numbers, bad things happen. Um, usually this is done in a more approximate way, right? Like, so these are the RTTs by um, color. Uh, so green is faster um, to a particular um, anchor in the right Atlas network, which if you just look at the colors, you'll guess it's kind of, yeah, it's probably there in Europe, right? And you'd be right, yes, it is indeed in Europe. Um, when we looked at this, we actually found the internet RTT is the sum of delays at each hop. A lot of these are variable. You can only derive distance when your queuing stack and application delay are held to zero, which basically never happens. The um, network operations uh, rule of thumb that one millisecond of RTT is a little bit less than 100 kilometers at distance holds. Um, so if you know the IP addresses, then um, trying to do uh, uh, geolocation by exclusion based on RTT data is um, somewhat more erroneous than even the cheapest, lowest quality IP geolocation database, right? If your RTTs are over 10 milliseconds, 
which doesn't happen in the internet all that often, then you're getting at best exclusion information for national level, right? So this isn't a problem. But we were concerned in general about the geo privacy implications of, of, of passive observation of RTT. It turns out to be not that scary because of all of this variation. Um, but then we, we, we flipped this question around, does active observation of RTT pose a problem? And this is one of these things we were actually just sort of like cleaning up the, um, uh, we were writing a paper on this and we were sort of cleaning up the, you know, we're looking at all the loose ends, you know, we're actually gonna get this question, so let's actually go ask that question. And we asked the question about remote load telemetry kind of as an afterthought, right? Can a remote entity armed only with ping get information about the operation of machines on my network? So, you know, this is me, this is the internet. Um, and here, if we look at the, you know, the equations before about how we actually, what these components of, um, uh, of RTT do, then the load on the network is equal to the sum of the queuing delay in one direction and the sum of the queuing delay uh, in the other direction. Um, if I have a cheap router and somebody's going to ping me from very far away, can I actually get information? So what I did is um, I set stuff up on my cheap router and I um, started downloading my kernel from somewhere and then I pinged myself from Singapore and Amsterdam and I got this. That trough to peak, so that's like basically zero. It turns out I'm in Zurich, which is not that far from Amsterdam. This is Singapore, which is about 220 milliseconds. It's a little bit farther away. Um, when I was, and I was pinging myself here like, you know, about 10 times a second. And um, when I started um, downloading stuff at full rate, you know, boom, I see this peak of 800 milliseconds. I'm like, wow, okay, I'm an internet measurement researcher. I probably should have noticed that I have a second of buffer bloat in my own network and I hadn't before that. And it was kind of like, wow, that's scary. And then I went down here and I actually started using um, uh, rate limiters um, to limit the rate to other than full rate. Let's not fill up, fill up the entire pipe. And I was even able to actually see some, some variance here um, when I was pulling down 300 kilobits a second on a, a um, or 300 or 30 kilobyte, 300 kilobytes a second on a um, 40 megabit link, right? So even if I'm only at 10%, I can actually, you know, that signal looks different than that signal looks different than that signal, can actually estimate the rate across there. So my connection sucks, good. How widespread is this phenomenon? So we stood up um, a uh, piece of software that if you go and you click on that link right now, you're probably gonna cause it to fall over because I've never actually had a room this big go and click on it. Um, so feel free. Um, it actually kind of does work. Um, I'll warn you the JavaScript was me learning JavaScript over Christmas vacation. So um, you might get in a situation where you give me data and I don't show you the graph if it fails and says that I can't ping you. Um, send back the link to me and I can give you your data if you're, uh, if you're interested. Uh, the way that this work is that, you know, I have a ping server somewhere. It has, it's the client sent JavaScript sends a ping request. The ping server starts pinging. Then after delay, I start downloading, actually, I think I start downloading the Hubble deep field um, from a CDN somewhere. Um, I keep pinging. Uh, and then, you know, the, the ping server itself keeps the ping information. It'll only actually ping the public IP address from where the request comes from because you don't want to turn this into essentially a botnet. Uh, and uh, I left this up and, uh, you know, kept this running and uh, updated stuff from just before uh, I left for Montreal. We ended up with 106 measurements from 66 different networks. Um, 33% of these networks always block ICMP. Uh, and, you know, so seven eighths of, of definitely mobile networks. So basically we classified these by um, autonomous system number uh, to see, are you an access network? Are you a, um, uh, you know, are you a terrestrial access network or a mobile access network? See a lot more ICMP blocking in mobile access networks because there's, you know, generally some sort of NAT somewhere along the path. Um, on 33% of these networks, there's no indication of load dependent RTT, which means that last mile segment is either um, there's actually not, so you're you're uh, you're hitting a thing that is not um, the uh, congested queue on the way down. There's a queue in the way, or um, the queues are tuned in such a way that you don't actually have buffer bloat. And we're into remote load telemetry, which might work on um, about 14% of these networks. So, you know what this looks like. So, you know, we start pinging here, we stop pinging there. This is um, one Swiss uh, access network, and you see here. Um, even though you have a public IP that's pingable at that point in time, uh, you see no variance. 
this is what happens when you do it on my network. So because of how the pinging works, we don't get we don't fill the queue all the way to the top. It's not maximum uh, maximum load. I'm only seeing 300 milliseconds of variance there as opposed to 800 milliseconds. And this is a very easy signal to sort of see. Um, so coming out of that, you know, recommendations for protocol design. Um, Remote load telemetry, anyone who can ping you from anywhere on the internet can measure your network activity. I will leave why this might be a thing that you don't want as an exercise to you, the audience. Um, and you can take away sort of like two bits of advice here. Some of it is good advice and some of it is bad, bad advice. And it seems that there's evidence that both bits of advice are being followed in various places, right? Like so, two ways to fix this. You can deploy all the buffers and deploy AQM and ECN, that will fix it, right? And, and there's at least anecdotally, um, one of those lines where everything is good, that's how they fixed it, right? Like, because I know the guy who built the network. Um, bad advice, you could also just roll out CGN everywhere and block out, block ICMP. Um, that would also fix this. And um, other forces are causing that to happen as well. So with that, I'm done and we'll take questions. How much time do I have? So. I'm struggling with your initial premise because I believe the only private information that this exposes is that you have a crappy router. And well, I mean, if you ping me over time at a rate that I'm not going to notice, you can tell when I'm using the network versus not using the network. And if we go back here, there's if you ping me faster than I was willing to ping with this hack. Um, the pattern of I'm doing a bulk download looks somewhat different than the pattern of I'm doing adaptive bitrate multi-streaming. So, so there's there's a difference between web, uh, web and Netflix and chill on this graph. Now, in this case, this was 10 pings a second. So, if I had a competent network in front of me, they would probably actually report that as abuse. But I also have 800 milliseconds of buffering on my cable modem, so um, I'm not sure I have a competent network in front of me. All right. I was able to do this to myself for a long period of time and nobody noticed. Uh, <laughs> I believe you can do it. I guess I'm just insufficiently paranoid to uh, consider that uh, private information. Okay. What's your IP address at home, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, why do you need the ICMP echo? Why not just sending TCP SYN and waiting for the reset? Uh, I could also do that. Um, the reason that I did ICMP is because I was using ICMP in the rest of the study and I wanted to wanted to compare ICMP to ICMP, uh, ICMP to ICMP. Another reason not to do, I mean, so if ICMP is blocked, you can use TCP, um, SYN and reset. Um, no, you get SYN and then you get a reset if there's no server. Yeah, right. The TCP send to reset gives you the, gives you the, the I mean, really the, the, the short answer is I was lazy. Um, Ping was already in the environment, and I wanted data that was comparable to the to the rest of the study for the paper. Yeah, um, Giovanni at the end. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, coming back to the the Ping thing, I think that Stefan just said the good thing about Ping is just like it's less blocked than other applications as well. It's less invasive, so there's the good side of it. The bad side is many networks treat Ping differently. They put like in right, exactly. Part. So I was wondering how that impact your results. So it might be that some of these. Um, uh, some of these networks where there's no indication of load dependent RTT is because the ping packets go through the same queue um, assumption doesn't hold. Uh, and actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to take Stefan's idea and actually hack up the tooling to be able to do the SYN RCT um, hack as well because that'll, um, that should go through the same queue. Uh, in ways that, that ICMP won't. And if I rerun that on the networks that I already have information on, then that could, uh, I could see if I can get any out of that no indication of load dependent RTT space. So thanks, that's good, good advice. Uh, Wes Hardiker, ISI. With respect to the privacy problem, um, so in NDSS, the DNS workshop this year, I showed that just by studying DNS packets leaving my house, I could determine things like sleep-wake cycles and right, right. stuff like that. So uh, this sort of actually augments that even further because, you know, certainly we all stream Netflix starting at 8 p.m. at night, and right. that's when we watch most of our bandwidth, and uh, we'll notice when you're not at home and things like that, and when you're at work, and, and those those do become important. Yeah, so the, so the, the thing that kind of struck me about this is that the DNS um, stuff requires you to be somewhere on the path between the network 
and it's first recursive resolver, right? Like, so you you need you need some passive um, you need some passive measurement here. Yeah, specifically, and, I studied it from the point of view of 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 an authoritative right, server. Right. So so actually, okay, just actually looking at from, stuff. Oh, okay. Yep. If if I was All just right, .com, yep, yep, yep. for example, I could determine your your right. wake cycles. Right. But I was able to run this just by renting a a, a cloud server and pinging people. So. Hey, uh, Benjamin Dam, I just wanted to say I really appreciated the research. Uh, I think it's very insightful. And uh, I'm reminded of the adage that uh, if you haven't got anything to hide, that's because nobody's trying to hurt you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, think about this. You can also like use this for, to monitor, for example, different web page, websites and the load they receive and get like a lot more information, not only for personal information and like for example, corporate information, how many people are visiting your site, when they're visiting. Uh, Lorenzo Kuliti, I mean, uh, uh, you had good advice and bad advice. There's sort of like partially bad advice as well, um, which would be sort of randomized delays on ICMP responses, yep. something like that. Right, that would. Break ICMP Probably more bad than good. Four. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna put that in. I'm gonna put that straight up in the bad advice column. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Kieran is next. Um, so Kieran presented already at the um, NR. Uh, no, applied NRNW uh, workshop on Monday. Um, so you might have seen him already, and he's here the whole week, so we took the opportunity to ask him also to present some of his other work in this meeting. Thank you, Mirja. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kieran Scheidle. I'm a PhD candidate at Technical University of Munich, and I'll talk about a quite specific and quite technical topic today, um, which is um, de-aliasing IPv6 hit lists, and I'll briefly get into what precisely that even means. Um, it's based on two papers that I'm listing for completeness, so if you want the background, um, go to these and have a look. Uh, and of course, it's as everything academic, it's joint work with um, Oliver, Minu, Georg, uh, Pavel, Kasim, Marche, Steven, Luke, and Georg again. Um, so, I do a lot of security scanning in the internet, and in IPv4 that has become fairly easy recently because you can simply ping all the addresses. In IPv6 that doesn't work, the address space is just too large. So we are back to using hit lists, what we did for IPv4 10 years ago. Um, to have these hit lists, there's basically two approaches. One is first you need to collect addresses from whatever source you can get, DNS, uh, passive observations, whatever. And there's also some papers that then use these lists to generate more addresses, like learn the structure of IPs in those lists and generate new IPs and see if they respond. And there's plenty of related work going on, so I'm, I'm really not the only one doing something in that space. And the question that struck us is, are these lists biased? So are they biased towards certain ASs and prefixes, which means they would not give you a representative sample of the IPv6 internet? And this is really um, enlarged by the problem that a single host in IPv6 can bind billions of IP addresses to itself. So you can bind entire prefixes to one single host. And if you run into such an area in your hit list, you will definitely have a strong bias because you will count a single machine billions of times. Uh, we call this aliases because it's one IP address and or many IP addresses and just one host for which you have many alias addresses. So you can call it an alias prefix if all the IPs in that prefix belong to the same host. So um, just a brief intro. So this is what our current IPv6 hit list looks like. It's also published. So if you want IP addresses, they are there. Um, it, it consists of many components like domain lists and DNS, um, domain lists from certificate transparency, but also, for example, running trace routes to all the IPs and finding router IPs in between. So that's just a brief overview. We have around 50 to 60 million of IP addresses. 
The question is how many of these are real and not just aliases. So the state of the art in detecting aliases is, is basically saying, I'll take this prefix and I will send probes to certain IP addresses. They can be random or they can be fixed, whatever you prefer. And then if I get a certain number of replies, I say it's unlikely that some random IP will just respond. So I assume this is aliased. And state of the art is somewhat um, that typically you only require a subset of IPs to actually reply. So let's say three out of eight or something. It's also typically done at a specific prefix length, like slash 69 or whatever. And the issue I had with that is that um, if you use random addresses, your targets may actually cluster. So a random process typically doesn't give you nice distributions, but you can have clusters, which you wanted to avoid. If you use fixed addresses, you get a nice spread, but people may predict those addresses and also they may be in use because if they stand out to you, they may also stand out to others. So what we said let's do is we said let's combine these two approaches. So basically, um, we enumerate all the combinations for the next nibble and then add a random portion. So for each prefix where we say this might be an alias prefix, we send 16 probes and they are reasonably well dis distributed but not predictable. And we do that at many levels and we also probe ICMP and TCP80. So some parameters that we used in this. When do we suspect something uh, aliased? It's if we find more than 100 IP addresses in some level of the prefix tree. Then we say let's run this alias detection on this prefix. Then of course we, say, we said we want all the IPs to respond, but of course there's packet loss. So what we did is we said if an IP replies on either ICMP or TCP, we'll accept it. And also we have a sliding window of past measurements where we also accept replies. And that works really well to really increase the bar to say all the IPs must reply. So we have very few prefixes where we have 15 or 14 replies or so. Typically it's either all or none of these random IPs that reply. And one very interesting impact that we did find is that we would actually find prefixes that appear to be aliased at a high level, like a slash 32 level, but then you could find tiny pieces in it that would not be aliased, where IPs would not reply. And this is a quite interesting phenomenon. So typically it might be that some portion is routed differently, like the um, all zeros address being used for routers or something. And hence we can't simply build a blacklist, but we actually build a multi-level prefix tree and do longest prefix matching in that to say which portions are aliased and which are not and to also have it not cover the full length under an alias prefix. Yes, that always takes a time to render. So what's the result? Um, basically, we had these 55 million IP addresses and almost half of these addresses were in alias prefixes. And um, if we do this plot, which we did using plot, which was presented at last MapRG by Luke, then you find it's very few prefixes and these make up a lot of addresses in this list. So this is, if you think about it as expected, but it's still quite, quite alarming that half of the hit list is basically just double counting one IP address or one host. So to us it was quite surprising that it's actually half of these addresses that are basically um, aliased. If you look into what are these prefixes, it's typically um, oh, there's a wide range, but a lot of them are Cloudflare, AWS or something like that. And we know they sometimes use tricks like um, having basically a, a packet filter on random IP addresses that will forward it. But still, you shouldn't be scanning and double counting these IP addresses. Good, then the next thing we did is let's do some validation. We have this technique that claims to find alias prefixes how can we increase our confidence that this actually does what it's supposed to do? So here we did use advanced fingerprinting, which we have used earlier to detect cases where an IPv4 and an IPv6 address belong to the same host. 
So you can use certain features to increase this confidence that it's really the same machine you're talking to on this set of IP addresses. Some of them are good in confirming this. Some are good in falsifying that. It's not always um, that black or white. For example, you can look at the initial TTL that you get back and it doesn't really mean something if it's the same, but it means a lot if it's different because then it's quite unlikely that it's the same machine. You can also look at TCP options fingerprint, like the order, the padding, these small details in TCP options replies, and also into TCP timestamps, which can be linear if you probe a lot of IPs in a prefix in a certain time order, and you get a linear TCP timestamp um, over all these packets, you can pretty much assume it's the same counter behind all these IPs, so the same machine. And what's important here to mention is typically you could say just use uh, Nmap fingerprinting, whatever, but we need this to scale. So all these methods work with just uh, one or two packets that we use for liveness probing, and we just extract more data from that. So it comes for free on top of our measurements. If you look at what we find, um, we fingerprinted um, these 20k prefixes that we considered aliased. Here we just do it at a 64 level, so we have a somewhat stable uh, set to look at. And the confidence, of course, depends a lot on the test, what I just say. So if it's the same ITTL, it doesn't mean a lot, but if it's different, it does. And of these 20k, basically we find 1,000 or so where we say, this looks odd, it looks like it's not the same machine, it displays some different behavior. But we also find 13,000 where we say even the timestamps behave linearly, which is very unlikely if you would probe different machines that they randomly pick the same uh, TCP timestamp value over time. So for us, this was a confirmation that our approach of finding aliases works reasonably well. There's few inconsistent ones, but the majority is consistent and there's a big portion that is actually very strongly co consistent where TCP timestamps give us a really high confidence that this method of finding aliases works. Good, so um, for you to take away, if you use an IPv6 hit list, it can contain large clusters of aliased prefixes and aliased IP addresses. So in our case, half of the IPs were basically the same machines. Um, if you use multi-level prefix detection, you can also with higher confidence cut out these small pieces that are actually not aliased in a space of an alias prefix. You can use fingerprinting or some other technique to really boost your confidence that what you used, to, what you did to find these alias prefixes actually worked. And yeah, the paper and plots are online. I've, I've put the link here and there's also a bunch of other stuff that I'm working on and happy to discuss offline with you. Thank you. Eric Nigren, um, when you're looking when you're looking at this <clears throat> things behind a prefix, are you look and you think have this topic of like same host, how do you handle load balanced clusters or think about load balanced clusters in that sense? Because there are, I'm aware of some cases of this where you'll have a IPv6 prefix where most things will answer, but instead of being a single host that it's going to, there's some sort of load balance on those things. So different, the same IP, the, any given IP within that prefix might go to some set of machines within that cluster, but mm -hmm. they're still logically the same and still might be a result in a larger hit list than you'd necessarily want to be monitoring. Yeah, so if, if, if I quickly synthesize, you're saying if there's a load balancer, it might actually be different machines, but they might, all the IPs might seem to respond, but not from the same machine. Right. Yeah. And do you consider that to be a single host, or does that just get disqualified? That sh so the initial method would uh, classify that as alias, because all these random IPs respond. With that in uh, validation step we do, we would not consider it alias, because the different machines would probably have different characteristics in these small fingerprinting details. Uh, Lorenzo Caliti, I, uh, we keep hearing about this sort of attack and with um, more end-to-end -end connectivity coming back, we'll, we'll, we'll see even more of it. Um, I was wondering the other day if we can, if we could say, 
Look, any field in any packet that's reserved should be random. And I think that's sort of not forward compatible because, um, you know, you can agree stuff, but then you, you basically, um, when implementations get updated to actually support the options that, you know, that, that were previously random, they might actually interpret it. And I'm wondering if there's any solid way to do that, like sort of um, require that every that every option has its own checksum or something like that. So we can basically fill everything that's currently unassigned in a packet with random data all the time and require that protocols do this and then make sure somehow that when those option numbers actually get allocated, we can validate them on the receiver. Uh, and that would be sort of like a more structural approach to this kind of, yeah, we design something and then, you know, people figure out how to sort of, you know, understand like what is actually behind it. Because a lot of our protocols just say reserved must be zero. And we faithfully do that. And, you know, here, right, you could say, well, I'm just going to send a random TTL on on replies and random randomize other stuff. So j just a thought, really. Just to understand this, are you proposing to always use all defined TCP options and just put random crap in there? I mean, a lot of a lot of protocols already do this, right? Like we're just going to set random options all the time, right? It's just like I mean, it's a lot more data, right? You send over. The, it's a lot more overhead. Yeah, but the overhead is is generally sort of a small minority compared to the payload. So. If you're, you know, I guess it, it boils down to how much you're willing to pay for privacy. Because in this case, right, if you don't have, I mean, it's a lot more difficult. Right? So yes, uh, basically, there's a there is some steps that you can do to increase your privacy to protect yourself from the fingerprinting. You could, for example, just rotate the TCP options that you send back. Also, since version 4.10, Linux uses uh, randomized start values for TCP timestamps, so that that doesn't work starting from Linux 4.10. So I think there's reasonable steps you can take to avoid that fingerprinting. No, but I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about, like it, instead of like doing that tactically once, it, once the attack's already in the field, how can we sort of more design protocols to be robust to this type of thing as we design them and as the implementations basically get written? Tobias Fiebig, to Delft, uh, first comment on the first uh, previous question. Um, I think the problem would also be if you fill up random, um, you basically end up leading your entropy to the internet um, because you have to have a lot of random to put in all these packets you're sending out. I would like to take this discussion to a different working group or the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing is, did you compare? Um, so we have this data set of um, IPv6 reverse DNS zones. Um, and did you compare the zones we tag as dynamically generated with the ones you identify um, as like clusters uh, from other hit lists? I did not do that part. If you sent it to us in your data set, we did. <laughs> IPv6.farm um, online Sorry? available. IPv6.farm or data sets are online and available under that address. So also for the rest of the room. Yeah, I mean, we've been in contact before. Yeah. Igor Lubashev, uh, to continue on a little bit more to explore Eric's uh, question about load balance cluster. You can have a load balance cluster with pretty large prefix behind uh, that it's serving, right? And it may have not many machines, like a, under a dozen. But if effectively all the IPs are, let's say, they are randomized as they're going to the backend server. So your second method will classify it as um, several million different machines or still under a dozen? So if you, just let me repeat it again. If you have a large prefix and several load balance chunks in it. Well, and let's say the backends pick up, uh, get load balanced randomly uh, from that large prefix. Um, probably that would be considered not alias because as soon as you end up on a different server, some of these tests will start to fail. So right. I'm, I'm quite confident that we really only count it as alias if it's the same machine. Yeah, I mean, if you could try to classify it possibly into not just one bin or multiple, but like 
keep track of maybe several alternatives based on timestamps or something else that could help. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jim Metat here. Um, I'm just curious whether you identify what kind of host uh, that has like a very huge address space such as slash 32. I can imagine the uh, slash 64 is occupied by a single host, but slash 32 cases like slash 32 seems to be very strange. So I yeah. don't know if you have any idea about what it is. So we, we found one slash 29 that was Basically, all the IP addresses would show you the same engine X is working on this <laughs> machine website. So we even found slash 29s that were just the same machine. Mm. OK. Very quick, but please. Just a random thought. Maybe that's a firewall of some sort that does proxying. So it, so to, it, it looked like a web server because it had this Nginx thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, again, have a look at the presentations on Monday. They were like more focused on TLS and HTTPS. And I hope you come back with more results next time. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm not Anna or Ian, but I am Gori. So um, this is a paper that the three of us put together for TMA and the full text of the paper is available, um, open source. So you can look at that, that's in the final URL. Um, the paper was about measuring the usable maximum packet size across an internet path. And I've um, changed this talk to talk about how can we make path MTU discovery work to try and make it more ITF focused. Um, okay, so, so how do things work really? Um, it's good to send big packets because the internet can send big packets and we have something called path MTU discovery, full standard IPv6, works with IPv4. It's just a network layer mechanism. Um, you have a certain size of packet you can send. Um, it's supported some places, not other places. You get an ICMP message back. You choose a smaller number because that's what works. Hey, it's cool. Um, ah, it doesn't work. And um, that's what the talk talks about. Path to big messages, ICMP messages, V4 or V6, are somewhat unreliable. Um, we know ICMP firewalls drop this, some CPEs drop this, ECMP tunnels, other firewall processing and corporate domains all drop ICMP and black hole the data when you try and send a big packet because you never know that the data was too big. So big packets don't work. How but, and if you've been in the transport area, you probably know this, uh, we can do things at the transport layer. Um, the transport layer can figure out that packets don't get through. So when it discovers this, maybe it can decide to just send less. Aha, we've talked about that in the IETF as well. So that's the background. Um, hmm. Here's the first fix that came from the community. Um, okay, so TCP is the most common transport still, and quick might emerge soon. With TCP, the server side advertises an MSS, the biggest size of packet it can accept. And it sends this through the network, and the client then knows that you can't send packets bigger than this because the server doesn't want them. So how about you just change that number in the TCP SYN packet, change the MSS option to a smaller value. So in this case, the CPE changes the value from 8960 down to 1452 to be helpful. It's called MSS clamping. It's quite widely deployed, as we'll see later. So, um, given we know this stuff happens, we did some measurements. The first set of measurements are taken from a set of data centers going to the top uh, 1 million web servers. And yeah, we tested them. We have 4 million points in this data set. And let's look for IPv4, what we saw. This is the MSS scene in the SYN coming from a web server somewhere in the internet looking at the top 1 million. And for IPv4, we see 1460 as a common number, which is what we might imagine. And this little tail off across the bottom, about 25% or so of locations um, return something smaller. Maybe there's tunnels in the way. Maybe there are some link technologies which are different. Um, so there's a kind of distribution that looks like this. The V6, the shape of the curve looks like this. Oh, that's odd. Um, this number is what you expect. Um, this number is not what you expect. So where did 1220 come from? 
And well, um, if you followed the v6 ops groups, you would know that there was an ECMP problem. Um, ECMP load balancers don't know how to return the path to big message to you because they have two potential places it can come from. Life gets difficult. So the first hack that was put in to fix this was simply get the servers to advertise a smaller MSS. Um, 1220. Now, now everything works here. Yeah? And Akamai, who did the work, um, saw this as an interim problem and they described how to fix it on their web page. Obviously, they fixed it for this because v4 no longer does this, but not for v6. Oh, but really, this isn't quite this story. Um, <laughs> v6 world's not as big as we think it is. 80% um, of these points on this IPv6 curb are actually served by Cloudflare servers. <laughs> so, really, this is reporting on two different um, server configurations that are out there. If you work for these people, you might want to talk to us, because <laughs> you could probably fix this. Okay, so that's a bit odd, but let's go further. Um, let's look at what happens on these paths that advertise an MSS that's smaller than the maximum you might imagine. So we do the same test and now we run a ping packet with the full size you might expect might go across. And lo and behold, 93% of them were reachable with a big packet. They just reduced their MSS. They didn't actually change their links at all. Okay, so well, that's an interesting data point. And as we use Quick, we know we can actually use these big packets. So that's good. Um, let's look at edge infrastructure. All that was taken from a place that was well connected. So if we now take some mobile clients in mind. Um, we used a, a test bed called Munro that had a number, um, hundreds of mobile nodes across Europe, and we could launch test campaigns from these sites. At latest, we used RIPE, RIPE Atlas probes to look at the wired case as well. So these green measurements are from the edge. Oh, even stranger. Um, we, we, we did our test, we got the results we expected. Then we sent some packets without an MSS option, SINs without MSS options. Uh, <laughs> lo and behold, we saw packets arriving with an MSS option set helpfully by the network, clamping this to a smaller value. <laughs> oh, that really is odd, and perhaps even odder, I, don't, I have no idea why these numbers were chosen by these particular operators. This is not a name and shame, we have bigger data sets and, you know, I mean, each operator has just has chosen some number to clamp to. But these are 1400 or 1410, 1420, 88, 8, 8, 8 hops, that's 21% of our data set, added an MSS option when we didn't ask for one. Hmm. Okay, maybe there's something about not looking at this MSS option in future. What about the wired edge? Okay. Turns out mobile operators weren't as bad as you think. The wired case varies wildly. Um, we had 3,000 RIPE Atlas probes, and we surveyed a number of different places. 4.8% of our probes arrived carrying an MSS option as well. And some of these were even bigger than the maximum allowed by a 1,500 byte Ethernet link. And yet we know they were on Ethernet links. So, oh dear, people are adding MSS options and clamping, but they're doing it not necessarily in a very um, obvious way. People are trying to help. Well, always good to have help. <sighs> so, um, let's stop looking at what the network does because there's a lot of data in our paper and I've got the link to the paper at the end of my talk. Let's instead now try and use PathMTU discovery. So, in this case, we use a tool called Scamper. Many of you know this. Uh, we also use Netalyzer and Traceroute. Um, we set up a node in a place where we could control it, and we artificially reduced the MTU of the link. And we saw whether the remote server could choose the right size of packet to send to us. So for the mobile edge, um, a 1500-byte packet was sent as a UDP probe. We set the DF flag for IPv4, for v6 it was already set. And a small data set, but... Basically, um, the mobile operators were doing well. Um, that's good. And um, what about for the actual data with V4 for um, wired networks? This is Scamper connection. So the first line is the MSS was reduced in our connection and therefore we didn't actually do the test. So the pale one needs to be ignored. Um, 60 or so percent of paths actually used PathMTU discovery and worked. 
Is that good news? Maybe. Not so brilliant from a transport perspective if you think that 40% didn't succeed in doing the thing you thought it was going to do. About 20% failed because they failed to get the path MTU discovery to work. Um, some stacks didn't set the DF bit when we asked them to do it, which is a bit annoying. So that accounts for the 12%. Some networks cleared the DF when we set it, which is very helpful because that, then the packet got fragmented. That's perhaps why V6 doesn't allow this. So that's the kind of left side of my plot. The right side is where we now filter all the ICMP messages. So we black hole the ICMP messages. Life gets a little evil here because path MTU discovery succeeded in only 8% of the cases because their path MTU discovery algorithm had a way of detecting this and dropping back somehow, commonly called black hole detection. Hmm. So, not brilliant news. What about V6? Must be better, eh? 95% um, succeeded. <coughs> That's good. Um, except that, remember, um, many of these paths didn't actually send big packets anyway, so it's not as good as it seems. Um, Hmm. The paper's got a lot of detail in, and I'm happy to talk about the detail, but really you should read the paper and look at the plots if you're interested here. What's the takeaways? Path MTU doesn't work reliably. It's a nice thing to have down in the IP stack, in IPv6 and IPv4. Um, it, if you can make it work, that's cool, but it really doesn't work reliably. The obstacles are actually obvious, but the useful thing perhaps in the data is we actually tested them and figured out where it doesn't work and how likely it is that problems occur. And path to big messages often don't get there. Some path to big messages are just simply wrong. Um, there are CPEs generating path to big messages with some bytes just set wrongly, and um, probably just copying the wrong bytes of data here and there and then sticking it in the packet. <laughs> there are path to big messages that you can't check where they come from because there aren't enough bytes. Surprisingly common v4 configuration is only return eight bytes of packet header, even though the host requirements for v4 say return 576. They probably didn't read the host requirements document for v4, which has kind of been out there for a while. Anyway, a smaller MSS is commonly the way that people have used to control this problem. They simply lower the MSS for path MTU discovery for TCP, which means that many servers don't really do the path MTU discovery algorithm anyway. MSS clamping is common in the network as well. How can we make path MTU discovery work? Because, I mean, I'm here to try and make the network work. That's why I come to the IETF. Well, first of all, we have some measurements. And I love having measurements to start with. That's why I'm talking here. And we're going to get more. We've already started getting um, several million more data points uh, to try and really understand the idiosyncrasies. The issue here is we really are concerned more about the cases where things go wrong than the high percentage of cases where things go right, because you really want this discovery to be reliable. Ah, you can make it reliable. We invented something called TCP PLP MTUD, which is basically an addition to TCP that does the probing in the TCP stack. In theory, this fixes it for TCP. It's RFC 4821. We've been asking people to use this in the IETF. <sighs> Big sigh again. Unfortunately, the implementations of this are slightly broken. Maybe because people use MSS clamping, they don't actually exercise the code, so nobody cares enough to fix it. But many of the PLP MTUD implementations we looked at were either not enabled or they were not really um, functional. They didn't do harm, they didn't do anything useful. So um, TSVWG has a work item, um, it's called this. It's looking at doing PLP MTUD for datagrams. We're starting afresh. We are making something that will work with UDP. Um, it will work with various applications running over UDP, including um, including Quick. Hopefully, we have some um, hack hackathon activity to make this work with Quick, um, also with SCTP, and we think this might be a good solution to this problem space. And with the measurement data, we might be able to build something that's robust and works reliably across the whole of the internet. Maybe in future, we could come back and redo the TCP thing 
in a similar way and try and get TCP working in the way that we finally managed to get Datagram working with UDP. I promised you a more detailed copy of this. It's available in our TMA paper. Um, this is um, an open access publication. You can download the data and you can download the paper and we are doing more work. Questions, please. Aaron Falk, thank you for this great, uh, very interesting. Um, so much, it's uh, I'm still digesting what you've said, but it seems to me that you're, uh, uh, what you've highlighted is that some of the problems are in the network and some of the problems are in the end systems. And it looks like the stuff that you're proposing is focusing more on making things work in the network. As, um, is Are you also doing something to get end systems to correctly um, make use of, uh, um, of uh, the M2 discovery? Uh, and just an aside, I think that DPPLMPTUD has got to be one of the worst <laughs> acronyms I run into in the idea. It's, like, it's actually yeah, we, 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 we thought it was so long we were we, going to we keep it for a while. On that. No, I think PCP, PPL, PMT, UD is actually worse. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so, so the first answer to the question is uh, what can we do with the data and how can we use it usefully? Um, I think just understanding these things, we can immediately start talking to people who maintain stacks and say, hey, look, um, this stuff's going on and you might easily be able to fix this. That's cool. I think the real solution is to fix the transport protocols to work with this. So th there's a bit of work going on with the stacks and maybe, I don't know whether we can really change the operational practice of network operators. Um, we can tell them about it, they can learn and um, maybe some will immediately adjust. I don't know. <laughs> Who's next? Okay. So my question is very quick. Uh, my name is Yoshi Nishida. Have you ever tried to locate where is ICMP black hole? There is a way to, I think, you, if you have a this data, I think you can, to some extent, rockets where is ICMP black hole, I think. Oh, we can. Um, the, the, the tests I skipped over quickly were expanding ring searches, where we actually found the piece of equipment and where the MTU dropped and whether it dropped more than once on the path. So, so, so we have the data for it, and that will help us now construct test cases for datagram path layer MTU discovery. And I, I think we will we'll make those available to other people. Yeah, do you have the same? Do you have any other characteristic of the distribution of the black hole? Yeah, the characteristic is the internet's quite broad and very varied. Okay. <laughs> Can I just say it's packetization layer and it's Brian's fault that we keep saying path. It is, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Where's Brian? No, sorry. Please go. Oh, um, thank you for presenting this. Uh, Having been involved in some of the V6 load balancing a while ago, this is just like, so ICMP based is basically unfixable. And thank you for <laughs> clearly showing that. And I think doing it at transport layer is the only way that will ever work because it shares fate with the traffic that you actually want to work. And so I think the key things there are don't ever black hole, which means start small and like try to grow and don't ever increase latency, which means parallelize, right? You have to, you, you basically maybe send the same packet with the different sizes if you can. Cause yeah, so those are, those are gonna be, because like MSS, MSS rewriting has kind of those properties for TCP. Now you can't do that with any encrypted yeah. protocol, but I think those are the drivers, right? We were, we looked at this when we were doing the V6, um, the first V6 flips at Google and you've got these hurricane electric tunnels where the MTU of their network is 1500, but the tunnel is 1280 and they don't know that they have 1280. And so you send the packet and gets all the way there and it hits this, it hits this IMP and you lost an RTT. It was that right? We can't do that because if we impact, if we impact latency, we'll never ship this thing at all. And so 1280 it is. And so at the time, at least for a very long time at Google, I don't know what we do now, the outgoing M, the outgoing MTU, we never sent anything that was better than 1280, no matter what you announced to us, because we knew it wouldn't work. And even if it did, we'd have this latency impact. So think about that. Good luck. You know, thank you. Thank yeah. you for taking this on. Oh, thank you. I'm not too sure I'd buy sending the same packet twice with two different, same data twice, two different sizes. Maybe I would send a probe, which is what we're kind of talking about, that has no real content. 
but we can actually verify that it got through. And we don't... As long as it shares fate, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And we don't try and raise the actual packet size of the real data until we really know that it works. Jana. Um, Jana Ingar. Um, so, f f I, I, I want to agree with what Lorenzo said, um, and I want to take it a step further in the sense that I, I almost think that TCP, PLP, MTUD should be the first one to explore. And the reason I say this is because it's a, it's a full-blown transport. It's something that we can run traffic on and we can actually measure and see how much latency difference a particular mechanism makes or doesn't make. And that makes it viable for deployment. So if you have real traffic <clears throat> using a mechanism and showing that it doesn't cause any latency uh, increases, but it actually allows you to discover larger MTUs if they exist, then that's a valuable mechanism that can immediately go into other uh, things as well. Um, I absolutely agree with not relying on, on ICMP messages and going in the direction of doing PLP MTUD for TCP. And I, I think it's this is a problem we should solve. It's it's okay. It needs solving and it should be solved. So why is TCP a little harder for us to work with than with the UDP and SCTP stacks? The answer is simple. We can't actually send a non-data segment through the network and verify it got to the other end. Because TCP doesn't let you do that with a size. There's no padding facility in the TCP header. Um, so that's not a problem. And um, Mathis's RFC, which I mentioned, has a way of dealing with this. But the way of dealing with it is he interacts with the recovery yes. and the congestion control mechanisms directly. Whereas if you can send path probe messages, which are identifiable to you as probe messages and can be echoed, but to the path, they just appear as packetization layer messages, then you can separate these two and develop the algorithm quickly and efficiently without worrying about that other interaction, which can then be addressed by the transport. So that is actually part of my motivation for asking it to be in TCP, that that yeah. interaction needs to be understood. Oh, yes. And, and not just does it need to be understood. I think it's an interaction that's important to s resolve because without that, again, you'll get zero deployment. We don't want to go through the process of trying to figure this out again and basically not have any uh, deployment. So in that vein, if doing it in quick is easier, then that's fine. Quick has the ability. You can send padded packets and you can do all of that. But the interaction with loss recovery and everything has to be um, has to be resolved. I will say one last thing. Which well, well, is on that one, yeah. um, come, come join us. We're playing with quick code. I'm sorry? Come join us from the congestion control side. We are playing with quick code. So we're interested in seeing how that works in quick. Yes. And we do intend to go back to TCPM if we have cycles in the end to revise Matt's draft if Matt's open to looking at that. That sounds good. You you called quick an application and I would I would take that back and call it a transport because yeah. I think it's important to make sure that we aren't building generic mechanisms for UDP, but we are building specific mechanisms for transports like quick. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Eric Nygren, based upon what you've been looking at, do you see, what, do you see any value in the um, path-based signals, such as the MSS clamping? Like, is the MSS clamping something that is is that is useful and helps here, or is it something that that as we start having um, encrypted protocols such as Quick are worth looking at and exploring ways of getting signals from the path, similar to MSS clamping, or is it a dead end that we should run fa um, far away from. I'm going to hide my blue dot. <laughs> Somebody just talking. Um, it would be nice to have better signals from the path. Um, MSS clamping wasn't the right thing. You were taking a side effect of something else, and you can stick any number in that you like, which is what we saw. Some people raising it, some people lowering it, some people creating it. That is a hike. Um, thank goodness we can't do that with quick. Um, could we do something else? Yeah, possibly. Um, Ron Bonica's talking about some truncation method that might work with V6. We're, we're sending um, probe packets through the network that you can somehow interact with the routers to figure out what really works. It could have some value, I don't know. I think my immediate takeaway is you've got to do this at the transport layer. It's got to be part of quick, it's got to be part of TCP, SCTP, something that understands how the UDP stack's operating. It can't just be done in the network layer part. Yeah, 
trying to get. She still wants to say something. Okay. But uh, I guess the next speaker could come up anyway. Yeah, it's fine. We can move on. Thank you. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody, again. So this work is done by me, John, and ISI, Mertz at, at SIDN Labs as well, and Twente, Ricardo and Paso Fundo, Marco, which is also sitting here in the back. Um, and it's currently under reveal, and we call it When the Dikes Breaks, uh, the second DNS defenses during the Nile surface attacks. Uh, we have seen that there's a kind of growth in the number of the DNI surface attacks uh, lately. Uh, they're getting bigger, more uh, frequent, and cheaper as well, and easy to be performed. So I think the latest numbers that we have is we, they have reached 1.7 terabits per second in 2018. Um, last year, Dyn, or 2016, no, last year, Dyn had a 1.2 terabit attack on the DNS infrastructure. It was used, Don used Mirai botnet, was the first big botnet doing attacks. And that we know, and you can actually buy DDoS attacks now as a service on the internet. The services are called booters, they call stressors, but you can buy them. And we have seen also the DNS has been target of DDoS. Uh, and in particular, there have been two cases uh, of DNS series attacks on DNS. And the problem with attacks against DNS is that breaks down everything else. If you cannot resolve domain names, you're not, your internet's not gonna work. But there are different types of attacks. So if you look at the left, that there was an attack that happened on the root DNS servers in November 2015. And this page here is the DNS moment from RIPE. And everything red here shows when they had reachability problems. And even though they, some of those root letters had problems, there were no known reports of errors seen by users. And that's kind of strange. So it's good for DNS, you know, even though they had problems, nobody kind of noticed from the user point of view. Uh, but on the other hand, the attack of Undyne, a big DNS provider in 2016, made to the news everywhere. This is the New York Times, The Guardian. Uh, Bruce Schneider was writing about that too in a bunch of other places because some users could not reach their proper websites. They were like, um, I think, Netflix and a bunch of others, New York Times. So if the user cannot connect to the main applications, they're gonna, you're going to have a problem. And the question that we wanted to investigate was like, well, these were two large denials versus attacks. They have very different outcomes, very different outcomes from the point of view of the users. And the question is why? So we wanted to know what factors actually impact this experience, what causes no change in the or sporadic problems. Uh, we know that the recursive servers on DNS, they have like their various, fail, uh, various mechanisms to cope with that. Caching is one of those, retries as well. And we want to know if operators can improve their services as well. Now, just a quick a quick recap on DNS. Um, this is a figure showing how pretty much DNS works. So if you're a user, you're here in a stub resolver and you wanted to know an IP address, let's say, from a particular domain. And the blue guy, the green guys here, these are the guys who know that they have the information. They are called authoritative servers. So somehow you have to get there to get an answer. But usually, you don't go directly. You have a bunch of recursive resolvers in the middle. These are the guys who are going to do the job for you. And there's, a, you know, if you're familiar with DNS, you know pretty much how that works. But what matters is these guys here, um, they may have caches in between. So if somebody else asks the same query again here, they're going to cache and give a uh, query uh, much faster. And if there's a problem here, they can, with the green guys here, these guys in the middle can retry to switch for servers, to retry a bunch of things. and. DNS records, they stay alive at the maximum, usually for as long as, for a value that's specified as a TTL time to live for the record. So this guy here, the green guy, will say, hey, you can start this record up to one hour, 30 seconds or whatever. So it's a, it's a store here, and then this will later go to the caches. Now, how can we evaluate the building resilience of DNS? So in this paper, what we've done, we broke down this into three parts. The first one, we evaluate like how caching really works in the normal circumstances and in a controlled environment by using like wild in the wild, we using ripe atlas. And then later we move to a production zone. We analyze that NL in the roots, but in the presentation and only cover that NL. That's the one I work for. And it's the graphs that I have here. 
And later, the part which is more interesting is we emulate the nice service attacks in the wild to observe. And the goal is not only analyze how the authoritative behave, we wanted to know how users see that because, well, that's the goal of our paper. Uh, all right, so how did you do this measurement for part one? You wanted to know how caching works. We register a new domain that has never been registered, cache tested right now. We run two authoritative image servers in EC2 in Frankfurt. We don't analyze any casts here. That would add a lot of complexity, but we have a bunch of work of any cast if you're interested. Uh, as vantage points, we use Red Atlas. Um, there we use 10,000 of those, and we consider vantage points in this measurement, not only the probe itself, but a combination of probe with local recursive. And each probe, they send a unique query, which is identified by their probe ID. So we don't want to, when someone asks a question, uh, one probe asks a question, we don't want another one to ask the same question, so you can interfere in the caches of each other. And we encode in each answer, we have a quad A answer information in a counter there that allow us to identify later, is in the paper, can I cover here, but allow us to identify if a query was answered by the cache or by the authoritative. We kind of increment this over time so we can actually determine that very easily. And have a bunch of scenarios. We, we play um, with these TTLs and to measure the influence of that. All right, so what do we control? We control the, the, the stub resolver, that would be the vantage points wrap Atlas, and we control the green guys here. We have no control here, and that's what we try to measure in this paper. We wanted to measure how resilient your recursive layer is. Okay, let's get to the results. How good caching is in the wild? What you see in this graph here in, in the x-axis is our different experiments. By the way, all the data sets are open. You can check on the website, on the paper. Uh, in each of them, we have the TTL we use in authoritative name servers. And these are the number of queries that we observed. And each query we classify in according to four categories. The blue ones in here are the ones that correctly went to the authoritative. They are answered, and they should have been answered by the authoritative, so they're fine. Um, the green ones here, we, it's the cache hit. They, they should have been answered by the cache, and they were. And what we're, we would see, so this is also good. And we, what do we see here is that caching working, it works it's fine for 70% of the times when it should work for the 50,000 VPs. And this is considering our not very popular domain. So people are asking for one, the cache test that I now called the A record. And this is not very popular. So only us were, only us were actually, uh, only we were crashing querying that. So I would expect to be even better. So this is kind of lower bound for that. But it's not so good news is that 30% of cache misses. This is shown by the yellow color here, the AC. And we are like, okay, so they're on, on the wild here, we see 30%. And why is that? There's a bunch of things. Uh, caches may have limits. Our domain was not that popular. Caches may be flushed and the recursive. And I refer to caches, you know, remember in the layer that we have no control, the recursive. They're very complex caches. Um, a lot of people now use any cache in the recursive layer. Uh, there's a bunch of free services out there, and some of them may have cache fragmentation. So we went further, we went to analyze what happened with the queries that are not answered um, by the servers. They're actually cache misses. It turns out that half of them are using public service. And this is, you can see the classification did. And half of the ones that are using public are using Google. Uh, again, this is a not popular domain. I would expect to Google behave better in a popular domain. So, all right. So this was in a control environment. We use in the wild using Ripe Atlas. But another question you may have: All right, how that would work uh, in the production zone? So we were I work for that now, and we have access to the data that comes to our authoritatives. So we just compute the time in between two queries that gets to us from their recursives. And for each recursive, we compute this time, and we, we choose a domain that was our authoritative name service that we announced on the zone, and you know the TTL that one is one hour. So this is the number of queries you analyze, is six hour period, uh, this, for this number of recursives. And we see that roughly 70% as well of the recursives, this is a CDF here, they actually query around the time of our TTL. So what it means here is that the, the, our experiments are also like the real zone. You can confirm the same here in a production zone on that I know. We also look into the, the roots with the roots using detailed data. It's also in the paper. All right. So what do we have so far? We know how caching works in the wild. Uh, and with that as a sort of a baseline, we can move to the part, interesting part that interests me. It's like how can we know that cache works also during stress, during um, a denial of service attack? to understand the user's experience. 
OK, so how are we going to emulate a DDoS? Well, we could have just tried to DDoS our services to Amazon. I don't recommend that. That would create a lot of problems. So what we do, we emulate a DDoS on the same servers that are Amazon. I just use IP tables, and I say drop 100% of the traffic or 50% of the traffic. That's a kind of approximation, because servers under stress are going to stop drop traffic. Um, there's some. It's not exactly like a DDoS because in a DDoS attack, you can have like links congested, routers both, uh, having problems as well to forward the packets, the queues, and a bunch of other stuff. But it's a good approximation for that. And again, we control only the, the, the authoritatives and the control here, is guys, but we don't control anything here. And you want to see how, if your recursive after, after you actually get your, got your back once there's a DDoS here, and if you can get an answer. Now, first scenario, this is complete. Uh, a complete DDoS means the server will drop 100% of the packets. And the TTL we set for this one is one hour, 60 minutes. This is doomsday scenario for an operator. If you, all your authoritatives are down, for uh, in this case, for one hour, this is the worst that can happen. And you wanted to know how much caching can actually protect. So in this figure here, um, you see like an arrow going down. And this means the time when you can simulate it, start to simulate it, the DDoS. So you will allow one, all the probes to send one query before we start simulating. So the crash, the, the, the queries, the caches of the recursives get populated. And, and after that, we, we actually start dropping all the packets. And next time there are more queries, we see like the blue guys here show people that are actually getting an answer. And you see a continuous drop until here is the time that caches expires and very few people get an answer. Like all the other cards are not getting an answer, they're having problems, so people cannot resolve the domain. But we, what we see here is that 35 to 70% of the clients here are answered by the, by, the, by the server, by the cache, I'm sorry, even though the authoritatives are down. So this is very good results. Uh, it's also very interesting here that even when the caches should have been expired, 0.2% of the clients are getting answers. And there's a draft in which unfortunately expire. It's called serve stale, which means like, you know, if, if a recursive cannot reach an authoritative, serve the answer you knew beforehand and just to save an answer. Um, so that's exactly what's happening here. This, there's a very little, uh, very small number of people getting that, but it's, I think it's a good idea. All right. So now let's change a, another parameter, another scenario. Um, we're gonna carry on with more doomsday scenario, like 100% failure, bracket drop, and then recursive. What you're gonna do here is like, instead of only allow one query before uh, the DDoS, you're gonna allow like one hour, which is pretty much like the TTL, so the, sh the, the caches should be more or less about to expire when you start the DDoS. Uh, and what you see here, the number of people getting answers during uh, after we start a DDoS is far lower, meaning that cache is much less effective as Times out near the attackers, their cache times out. Um, and some of the people here, the blue guys, are getting an answer because of, in, incidentally, because of fragmented caches, which is also very interesting because they end up filling up later. Um, and this second error here, I, uh, I just decided to switch up the server again and see how quickly they would catch up. And you'll see that very quickly, all of them catch up, all the recursives. They bounce back once the servers are up. Um, so the bottom line for this graph here is that, you know, it's, your clients are not going to get protected for how long your TTL is available. It actually depends on the, the state of the cache in the particular moment that happens. If your record's about to expire, you know, you're on your own. Um, all right. So we also want to know from the previous graph, you're going to now reduce the TTL from one hour to 30 minutes. That means that the cache, the, the record should be in the cache now, not only for one hour, but for only 30 minutes. And you can see if you like, if the recursives have a problem, the recursive would have 100% packet drop. Um, what do we see here? Uh, again, the drop is much quicker now because the TTL is smaller, so the records stay for shorter periods of time in the cache, and some people here get a uh, stale answer after the cache expired. So for the operators here, for DNS operators, and for well, well, anyone who uses DNS, think carefully how you choose your TTL of your records because you can buy uh, you may end up uh, wind up shooting yourself in the foot if it's too slow, if it's too too short TTL because you're gonna you know you be undermining the protection that the caches can deliver to your clients. Um, so this is this is covers completely DOS attacks, which means like the servers could not give any answer. Um, uh, yeah, I just talked about that, and but 
there's cases as well, what we call partial DDoS. It's DDoS attacks, they attack the authoritative name servers, but they're not strong enough to bring all of them down at the same time. That's exactly what happened to Dyne uh, with the roots in November 2015. And some other servers they go down, some of others they don't. So you also wanted to know, in this case, how users would experience the attack. Uh, so now it's not doom days anymore, but it's a, it's a very realistic one. So what do we do here in this particular scenario? We have a TTL of 30 minutes for the records, and we drop 50% of all the incoming queries on authoritative name servers to simulate a DDoS, simulate a 50% packet loss. And it's very interesting when we start a DDoS, when the arrow go down here, goes down here, we see like most of the users don't even notice anything. Most of the users get an answer. And I think that's a very good result. This is a lot, shows the resilience of DNS. And the only thing they would notice, is this is the RTT on the figure here below. We have to see the latency, actually. And you see that there's, a, uh, there's increase in the latency. So they take longer to resolve our domain name. Uh, but they, they're getting answers. And let's play a little bit more. Let's make the case worse now. Let's keep the TTL, but let's drop 90% of the traffic. Let's see what actually happens. Even we 90% of the packet with this TTL of 30 minutes, most clients in the blue here, you can see in between the arrows, they get an answer. So it's, it is, for me, is an example of good engineering. People who have developed that, who have built this into DNS, I mean, they, they, they deserve the kudos for here because 90% packet loss and like 60% of people get an answer, this is fantastic. And don't get me wrong, once somebody gets an answer, that goes to the cache of their recursive. So next time they come back again, they can fetch the record. So th it, this is like coming together, all these things, all the good practices. Um, let's now move to the another case in which you set a TTL to one minute. And if you set the record TTL for one minute, that means that nobody, it, they, nobody should get an answer from the cache. Very few people, only if they serve stale. Because once they fetch and they come back 10 minutes later, it's already expired the record. So you want to see when you have 90% packet loss, all your records have a TTL of one minute, you see that like even with no caching, theoretically, I mean, you can serve stale, 27% of the people get an answer, even though you have 90% packet loss, which is for me, again, a very great result for DNS. Again, you see a lot of, there's a different impact here in the latency. It goes much higher because, well, they have to do a lot of retries. We're going to analyze next, next. But it's, very, it's still very good results especially for operator. Um, next, yeah. All right. And on the, on the previous graph there, the, the success of DNS was doing to retries of what the authoritative names, uh, what the recursives would do. If they're not getting an answer, they're going to switch from server to server and they start to retry and then a bunch of other things. And in this graph here, we show a time series. This is measured at the authoritative side, the side at Amazon that we control. And we show the number of queries during number of operations. And for the 90% packet drop of no caching, we see an increase of 80 times the normal traffic. Of, of, and this is like not at the DOS. This is like friendly fire. This is like your recursives going crazy. And they, they cannot actually, not actually going crazy. They're doing their job. They're trying to resolve a name. They cannot get an answer. They try it again. They switch to another one. They try again until they get an answer. So what I'm, for an operator, if you're under the DOS, what this means that like, you're going to get a lot of friendly fire. I mean, your client's going to try to resolve that. So be aware of that. And if you actually over provision your DNS server for, for 10 times your normal traffic, be aware if you have 90% packet loss, you're going to get this number of people hammering you. So your traffic, eight, eight out of or nine times of your traffic is going to be just your friendly fire. So be aware. So implications, caching works, works and retries work really well. So kudos for the DNS community who had to build this. Uh, pro provided, especially if some authoritative stay partially up, that's that's really great. Um, and caches last longer, and provided as well that cache lasts longer than the DDoS. Um, for the DNS operators, you, in, one implication may have like if you can keep one up, things are kind of going to be fine. So you can make a, one of your services very strong, but it can be very careful. Like very, you got to be very careful with loads of distribution. We wrote a paper last year in IMC showing when you have multiple authoritative name servers, what happens if one is better than the other. So you, can, you may have a want to look at that. Um, we, the cool thing about this paper is like it can explain why the roots at the, the root did us outcomes of the particular attack happen because the roots have a very long TTL, one or two days, if I'm not mistaken, one or two, I think it's one. Um, 
so they're going to be in a cache two days, sorry, two days. And, um, and a lot of people kept cap the TTL for two days for one day, but it doesn't matter. It's still a long period. The attack was shorter than that. Uh, but we can explain that now. And there's a clear trade-off here between TTL of a DNS record that it authoritative serves, uh, sets, and the DNS resilience. So be care, be careful with that. And many commercial websites especially have short TTLs because a short TTL, when you change something in DNS, is very easy to propagate. It's very quick, much quicker. And it can explain that the pain of dying customers and users' perception. And um, just to give an example, I had a discussion with some folks on Amazon, and if you use their recursives, they're going to cap all their answers to 60 seconds. So just be aware of that. Um, conclusions, let's move to the conclusions then. So this is the first study to evaluate DNS resilience uh, to DDoS is from the user's perspective, trying to figure out how the recursive layer works and if, how caches retry work in the under stress. Uh, we evaluate design choices of various vendors, uh, user measurements. We actually have no information about, uh, very, or very little information about the recursive resolvers layer, which software that are using, we do, actually didn't care. We wanted to see in the wild, that was the goal. So caching and retries is very part, part, a very important part of DNS resilience. So if you're under attack, people do filtering, people do scrubbing, do a bunch of other things, but you know, DNS has already built in a lot of good stuff in it. Uh, our experience, experiments also show when uh, cache and retry works and when they don't. It's consistent with the uh, recent outcomes and the DNS community should be aware of this trade-off and I think it should, I, that's my personal opinion, but I'm not sure what the community thinks that it should advocate for, advocate for serve stay of deployment because it's your last resort when things go really, really bad. So I have a tech report here. This is my mail. I would like to thank Ripe NCC for uh, all the measurements again. They support us all the time. And all these people, Wes, Dwayne, Warren, Stephen, uh, and Martin for reviewing the paper. And the title of this paper is When the Dike Breaks. So this is a dike close to where I live in Holland. You can see the water level is higher than here. So if it breaks, I'm going to be swimming, and I hope that this never happens. <laughs> uh, John Reed, um, one thing that I thought was interesting is when you simulated uh, partial authority failure, I think you did uh, packet loss either 50 or 90% on yeah. both authorities. Is that correct? Yeah. So one thing that I think might be interesting for future work is uh, a complete failure of a single authority and the others 100% up. And then I think because, you know, in theory, the recursives should, as they go through the source list, penalize the non-responding authority. And I think it might be interesting to see how that actually performs in real life. Um, so I think I, I, I think I might have that in the paper. I ran that actually as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I, I can actually, I can give you an answer right now. Um, it will be just, I can tell you it's going to be just fine. I can re I remember the results because if here you have, um, what are you going to do? We have an IMC paper from last year that shows if one doesn't answer, they move to another one and they get an answer. So all of them are gonna get an answer. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I would have to double down and check the paper, but I think I remember the results, they all get an answer. Okay, so it's in the paper that's linked. For yeah, I, oh. yeah, it's in the okay, paper. Great. It's not in the paper, contact me, I'm not sure if you remove because of the space, but it, it works. Okay, and then the other, another question I had is, at, is there any opportunity, I think, for research between the uh, stub and the recursive uh, if one of the recursives goes down, because I think there's a lot of variability in what operating systems do when multiple recursives are configured, how they recover, et cetera. Is that something that you've ever done any research in? Or? So I, I didn't look into that. The way that RIPE works, it's like each probe is configured with one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. It would be difficult to do with, the, with RIPE Atlas probably, but yeah. I mean. Um, that's an interesting case. We haven't looked into that. All that we look at the recursive layer as a black box and we just okay. you know, analyze the results. But for sure, that would be an interesting result. Thanks. Thanks. Robert Kishtaki, Ripe NCC. Um, somewhere early 2017, we added uh, two measurements to each probe. So it's a built-in, if you plug in a probe, it runs already, um, measuring root servers in particular, um, like every 10 minutes or so, with the intention that we are trying to capture data in case there is also an another attack against the root servers. Um, so I'm not looking forward to it, but if it happens again, um, we will have some baseline data that is close enough to what the users probably observed. Mm. Um, but I, sorry, just to understand, you use the probes to contact the roots, or you just use let them use the resolvers? So local resolver. All right. Cool. Basically, oh, we're doing two queries. One is a, for a random domain, so you expect a, a no answer. And another is well-known domains like Google, Facebook, and so on. Oh, and that's so great. So um, if shit hits the fan again, um, we hopefully will have some good data. And is it built-in, like all the probes do that? Yep. 
can, can you send the, the, the measurement ID in the list maybe to me? Yes, I can do that. Thank you very much. Paul Hoffman. So I love measurement, love the stuff you do. Didn't like your conclusion that we should start looking at, at uh, uh, serve stale again. I don't think your conclusion actually matches your data because of what you just said to the last person. If one of the authoritatives is up, you're going to be okay. So an assumption that many people might make is a, a way for an authority, for a zone to do it right is not to really worry about the TTLs so much as well as, you know, to have enough authoritative servers. Um, and so, I mean, you definitely measured one knob well, but serve stale deals with two knobs, and I don't think you can match them in, in this. Again, your data and stuff is wonderful. I just don't like that conclusion about serve stale. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah, I mean, like in the paper, we, we, are, we don't we don't really advocate strongly for serve stale. But I, this is my personal. I mean, because I see like it would it work in our experiments. But I, I agree, we have to look that carefully. But it was the only hope for people not getting an answer. But yeah, yeah. thanks. So thanks. Okay, thanks. I'm Jimmy Tatia. Uh, probably related to the previous question by Paul. Oh. Um, uh, have you? Uh, examining the uh, TTL or other parameters, the answers in the case of the cache expiration to confirm it's more likely to be an uh, effect of. Uh, I'm sorry. Cache I'm, step. I, uh, no. Did you did you see uh, details of the answers uh, in the case of? Did I see what? Sorry. Uh, am I clear? No, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not getting it. Sorry. Uh, did, did you did you see the details of the uh, answers in the case of cache expiration? Uh, to confirm uh, whether it's more likely to be a, the effect of um, uh, use stale, so like if very it's short it's TTL or something. Um, so every answer that we get, we have a counter that allows us to tell if it was answered from an authoritative or um, from the caches. And I have built a cache model in a paper that once we get an answer for the first time, we start a counter. We start actually putting a virtual cache in our analysis and then we can actually compute later if it was answered and it should have been answered by the cache. So we have all the information. Uh, check the cache session paper. Uh, I, I think I can clarify what he's asking. You had the up, down, up yes. question. You were saying, oh, people who live through it. I think your question was, if you actually have the answer on the second up be different, you can tell which things were um, stretched from the first. Oh, we have, first. yeah, we have. This is exactly this. Let me see. I did that for for the part one. Um, this this here. So these are we classify the answers according to like this was answered by the caches. We we know the TTL of each answer, so we have all this code. Okay. So I, I, again, I think the question, the the research question was, if you change what's going to come back, you can tell what had been stretched through what was going down versus. Oh, now it's up again, and it's getting the new answer. Is that oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yes. Okay. I didn't look at the transition from down to up. I, ju we, right. I just, well, we, but because, it, it's and, and that might actually go to your question of should we in encourage serve stale or not? Yeah. 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 Thanks for clarifying. I, I have one more question. Can I continue? Um, yeah. And also, uh, other related question is that uh, I guess uh, depending on the type of the recursive server, uh, the deployment level of um, use stale is quite different. I guess um, commercial recursive sub operators tend to uh, enable this kind of feature more likely. So I, I wonder what kind of uh, resolvers uh, actually tested in. So that's a good question. We um, there's I mean there's many vendors of DNS resolvers and they have different versions. And so what we have in the end is a population of resolvers is very heterogeneous. And what the methodology applied in this paper are like, we're not gonna try to profile them and identify them. That's too complicated. We're gonna look at them in a black box, analyze as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if there are any other studies to look into that specifically in the lab. You can do that in the lab, but our, our goal is to understand that in the wild so you can actually generalize a result. So there's a trade-off, but you can do in the lab. You can do that, say you can like, I can run um, bind there in a certain version and see what happens. You can actually do that, but we, we didn't do that because our question was like from the point of view of an operator and you want to know in a while, so it's a different thing. But yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Hi, Giovanni. Hi, so this is uh, Martin Arson with NCSCNL. Um, so I'm wondering what you research right now is DDoS uh, conditions at the authoritative. 
So in the Netherlands, we had this incident a couple of years ago where an access network got its uh, recursive DDoSed. And I'm wondering what part of the conclusions you think would mirror um, that scenario where you have an access network or an enterprise network that has, where the uh, recursives have trouble reaching your authoritatives and whether it makes any difference with respect to uh, Paul's comments about serve stale. And I'm not knowledgeable about that draft at all, so this might be a dumb question, but I'm, I'm just wondering what happens if the DDoS concentrates on the recursives instead of, or, or they're uh, linked to the internet. So, yeah, so if the DDoS happens on the recursives, I think it depends a lot on which recursive we're talking about because you're going to have a population of clients behind it being affected. Again, it depends a lot on the kind of the attack. But, I mean, uh, I'm not sure if I can, with my data, I cannot say anything about that, but the, what I can say is that the damage is going to be only around the people that connect to the particular resolver. So I would expect less damage than reaching an authoritative um, but usually, I mean, you can do that. Like most of the attacks we've seen is on an authoritative side. I mean, they get reported because this is more where the information is located. So I, 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 I wouldn't know how to say it. I just know the impact will be smaller on the clients unless it's a big provider like a, this big services one. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'm Wes Hardiker from the University of Southern California Information Sciences Institute. This is, I think, your fourth DNS talk for the day. Um, so I'm going to be talking about measuring uh, the DNSSEC and specifically the KSK role that's about to happen and some of the issues with it. Um, so first off, background. I'll give you a little bit of background about the DNSSEC and how it works, just in case you don't know. Um, hopefully you do. And then some problems that are sort of um, coming up with the KSK rollover that's going to happen in October and how small they are. Um, the case study analysis of, I tried to look into, well, what if we tried to really look into what a resolver is actually doing uh, with the trust anchors they have configured, how much can we measure that? And then uh, I'll look at the impacts of, I actually made some changes out in the real world that, that caused some benefits and how big those benefits are and how deceptive those benefits are. And then finally, I'll talk about some lessons learned with respect to sort of how the IETF really ought to think about deploying or, excuse me, designing protocols in the future, especially those with trust anchors. So for those that aren't familiar, DNSSEC basically has this top-down chained uh, authentication system that basically allows you to prove that a address that you're requesting, for example, either exists or it doesn't, and that it wasn't modified since the time that the original author published it. It's signed all the way down. In order to do this, though, you have to have a trust anchor for the for some ch uh, key up the chain. Typically, that is with the DNS roots that is run by IANA's uh, data set and their top-level key, which is the one that's about to roll. So one of the things that we realized uh, a couple of years ago, or I should say not, that the, the IETF realized a couple of years ago was that we needed to know what resolvers were actually using as a trust anchor. Um, it's very hard to know if there's millions of DNS resolvers out there, how many of them are A, validating, and B, how many of them are using your, the current trust anchor, and how many of them have a new trust anchor deployed so it's okay to switch it's very hard to determine a point of which it's okay to do a safe roll because most of the resolvers out there are using your new key and it's now safe to use. So RFC 8145 was written um, and it's called Signaling Trust Anchor Knowledge in the DNS Security Extensions and it basically adds one extra query to resolvers. So any more recently deployed resolvers running newer code should hopefully, when they are asking for a DNS key for the root saying, hey, what's your current key? They should also simultaneously send another query saying, oh, by the way, these are the keys I currently trust. And that way we can actually measure and watch how those keys are slowly being adopted and trusted. Um, so with respect to the current key role, the last, the first key for the, that was used to sign the root was created in 2010 um, with the expectation that sometime after five years, we'd start rolling the key. So the second key 
uh, was created in 2017. It was generated in October of 2017. And it was pub put into production, excuse me, it was put into publication, so it was actually first appeared in the root zone in um, July of 2017, last year. With the expectation that it would be put into operational use on October of, of last year. And then in just before that happened, so on the order of two weeks before, in September 27th, ICANN wisely decided to stop the rollover. And this came from this whole measurement system that I just talked about because there was sort of some unknowns. And so the, the next plan is that it will roll this October instead now that more people have had time to analyze the data, such as the data you're about to see. So this is the graph um, of the measurements of that 8145 separate set of signaling that I talked about. And if you actually look very carefully at the dates on the bottom, that gigantic uptick in black, which I'll get to in a minute, and black in this, in this graph is actually the bad line. Um, October actually existed before that giant uptick as well. So it's actually, actually got worse since uh, last September. But basically, if you look at this graph, the black line and the black percentages are on the right hand side are the number of resolvers that trust only the old key. So they don't trust the new key. So on the right hand side, which was March of this year, 20% of the resolvers out in the world that were sending RFC 8145 signals did not trust the new key yet. That had been published at this point for nine months. So yet they had still not picked it up. And so I kind of ran into this question of why, what's actually going on here? What, what is it that we can learn? What is it that we can measure? So I did a few things. I wanted to know why so many new addresses were appearing too, because it wasn't just that there's, you know, these resolvers that never picked them up, but we were constantly seeing new addresses that could be coming from new software deployment, could be coming from a number of things. <clears throat> but why were they only trusting the, the, uh, the old key? So I looked at two sources of data. I looked at all of the 8145 signaling data that ICANN had, which um, totaled about 1.1 gigs in size. And um, thanks very much to them for contributing that data for me to study. And, and was carried from January to March of this year. I also looked at all the incoming requests to, to uh, USC ISI's uh, root server, which totaled 2.8 terabytes of data. Um, and that was only just for March. So that was a lot of data. So the first thing I had to do is sort of reduce the problem space to something I could actually look at, say, over a weekend. So I, I did a couple of things. One, if you look at, in the ICANN data, there was 1.2 million resolver addresses sending queries to all of the routes. Uh, within that, 500,000 of them were sending signals for the old key. But what I found interesting is that within that, 310,000 of that 500,000 were signaling only once. In other words, they only sent one signal in three months. That's just plain wacky, right? These are things that should be sending a signal, we'd think, once a day or so if they were really resolvers on the internet, you know, that were staying up. Clearly, one signal is just strange. So then I looked into the B root data, which is line D, and... Um, of the sources that were sending to Beirut in March, there was 309,000. Um, 113,000 of those uh, were sending only the old key. And then 16,000 were sending the old key just once, again, looking for that same commonality. And then I noticed that a lot of them, and we'll see a graph here in a minute that shows this, were only sending a couple of signals, only a couple of total DNS requests, and they sort of went away. So it'd be like these resolvers kind of coming up and then going away immediately. So to summarize this you know, more clearly, there were 6,702 unique addresses that sent a single, I'm using the old key query, in the first quarter of 2018, and that signal went to Beirut during March and only sent two to nine other requests. That's just a very strange set of data. So I kind of looked, well, what would cause this strange set of data? So, um, quick graph, this is a CDF graph showing the number of queries sent, excuse me, the number of addresses sending, sent by the, uh, sending a number of queries. So on the, on the x-axis, which is kind of a strange way to think about it, on the x-axis is a log scale of the number of queries sent, and on the y-axis is actually the number of addresses sending that query in March. So you'll notice that there is 63% of the sources sent two or less DNS queries total 
in a month, in an entire month. That makes no sense, right? If you like bar graphs are better, this is the same sort of graph showing there's a huge number of hosts sending a very small number of signals. A very long tail, obviously. So I kind of wondered, is there a commonality? So looking at all of these requests, I looked at all the rest of the queue names that were sent to, um, to USCISI um, and then tried to see if there was a commonality. So I looked at, again, all the ones that only sent two to nine queries total. And what I found was that, of course, the highest number of, of queries sent were the signal for the old key, which is that strange cryptic hexadecimal underscore TA-4A5C. That's the query that's sent when you only trust the old key. Um, the second most popular was the root zone. And then the third and the fourth most popular were a single domain. And to, to the point of 3,000 queries followed by four, 400 queries um, for a VPN provider. And so clearly I thought I had found you know, a solution. At this point it was approaching midnight. Um, I very quickly realized you know, hopefully something was good and sent a note off to um, ICANN staff who actually managed to get me contact information, woke up at 5.30 the next morning to go immediately write them and say, hey, what's up? So I also examined the VPN provider software, downloaded the Android version of it because they have uh, multiple, excuse me, multiple uh, versions of their software. And I searched all of the files in the Android APK for um, the, D the DS record SHA-256 key looking for it. And sure enough, it turned up a root.key file that only contained the old key and didn't contain the new key. Yay, success. It also contained the lib unbound DNSSEC validation re uh, resolver, li <laughs> excuse me, resolver library. So I reached out to them. Um, again, thanks to Octo's, uh, ICANN's Octo staff for finding the contact information. And this vendor said, wow, you're right. It, it affects 10 you know, of our software packages and they promised to release something coming in the next couple of months. Um, so a couple of notes here. One, I'm, I'm actually, this vendor did the right thing. They were, they were using DNSSEC to verify that they weren't behind a paywall, verify that they were actually going to send their VPN connections to the right place. So they, they did the right thing, but then they failed to update the key in the long run. That being said, I'm still not going to release their name publicly, although it wouldn't be horrible to figure out. I urge you, please don't try <laughs> just for their sake. But let's look at the impact. So this is the same graph. Um, taken on Sunday, um, well, turning in these slides, and you can see the first indication where their VPN software started to be released, and there was a major drop. Um, only last week did the Android version um, get released, and actually iOS is now released. The slide's already out of date, um, and it's dropped a little bit since then, but it's still looking like it's flatlining. So we're down back down to, you know, 8% of uh, resolvers out on the internet are still signaling the old key, um, and I've taken care of one problem. One very important aspect of that, oops, one very important aspect of that, this is one user behind one address, right? So if other resolvers have 300,000 users behind them, it's not, an, even though the, the really dark bad line dropped by a huge amount, it does not, it's not reflective of potentially the number of users I've helped because there was a one-to-one -one mapping between IP addresses and users. So that was really hard. So I, um, looking into what other people have done, um, a couple of other people much more recently, Warren Kamari, you know, did a search for the old key in the GitHub interface and found that there was 2,069 references to the old key and only 412 of the new one. Um, I did a Google search, sort of similar things. There's more references to the old SHA-256, you know, hash than the, the newer one. Uh, Roy Ahrens has recently, um, in ICANN's Octo team, has looked into how serious are some of these and has found a lot of commonality and, you know, GitHub has forks and all that kind of stuff and uh, how many of those code bases are new and being used. Um, that analysis is not entirely finished yet, although he gave a presentation at IEPG, I think, on Sunday um, that I both missed and didn't copy his slides into this one because they were already due. <laughs> Um, so there's lots of stuff going on. So let's talk about lessons learned. Like what, what can we learn about this in the first place? Um, so first off, flag days are hard. You'd think, you know, that we would know that within the IETF by now. But within DNSSEC, because of packet size constraints, we can't do double signatures that easily. So, so ICANN's plan for rolling the key involved directly switching the key on a single day and not doing double signing for a while to let old and new users, you know, kind of migrate. Um, so that's hard to do. And more importantly for me, I tracked down only, a, you know, a small fraction of, of the actual traffic that was out there um, sending keys. In fact, B is still receiving 12% of its traffic from uh, addresses only single, signaling the old key. And tracking down misuse in, a, in over a million, you know, possible sources sending stuff to you is very, very hard. And I only solved a very small piece of the pie, as I mentioned. Um, 
But you know, why is it that rolling TAs for DNSSEC is so hard? Well, a couple of things. Um, the 8145 queries are actually hard signals. They are decoupled from the query of looking for the actual key, right? So the, 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 a resolver might send a query saying, hey, I need your keys, and then in a totally separate key that's not bound, send a query for I'm using this key. And those two queries can go to different places, so you can't even correlate them. As well as there's no indication of intent. You may just be, hey, I have these keys and I'm sending these, you know, I need these keys, but there's no indication that I'm going to use the keys to actually do validation. Um, so that's really what my, my recommendation is for the future. When you're thinking about designing, you know, internet protocols and things like that, um, include signaling within it, include sort of this intent mechanism, and then, you know, think about how, how software updates and how configuration updates, you know, happen over time. It's not easy. And uh, trust anchor keys are, you know, rather critical bootstrapping um, issues. So you really need to design for automatic updates from day one. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the DNSSEC automatic update you know mechanism, which is defined by um, fifty eleven, came after the rest of the DNSSEC system was designed. And doing it afterward is challenging because software updates slowly. So if you don't have everything going out on day one, you now have all these systems deployed that understand the cryptography but don't know how to update their base keys. And then also select update frequencies wisely. And there's really sort of two choices, and, and this is sort of a hint for a future presentation to come where I'm studying um, a bunch of systems. Um, you have a choice of doing it really frequently so that everybody gets used to the fact that it's updating. Um, Let's Encrypt, for example, you know, makes you update their, their uh, keys to your web servers on a three-month basis. You, know, you get used to it. You either have to automate it or, or you fail. Or you have to do it sort of rarely and expect that you know hard things are going to break and that you better use really strong, well-protected keys. You better have a, have widely overlapping signatures and things like that. So, um, when as security is being used more and more in internet in in IETF protocols, um, you really need to think about what happens 20 years down the line, what happens 10 years down the line when people need to update their keys. So, uh, any questions? This is we were last in London, so this is a nice picture from London, although ironically not from the last IETF, but the, from the London before that, while well, Roy walks to the microphone. Um, Roy Arons from ICA, ICANN, the uh, Octo team you just mentioned. Um, first off, there's another blob of data coming your way. You've asked for this last week, and, uh, and it was a bit busy this week, but it's coming your way. I appreciate that. Um, you mentioned um, flag days are hard, which is, which is correct. Um, but also in that same context you mentioned, doing double signatures um, might solve something. The problem is not that we sign with the new key. The problem is that we stop signing with the old key. Yes. And even if you do double signatures, at one point we need to stop signing with the old key. Yes. Um, so doing double signatures wouldn't really have solved anything. We would have that same, there would be a, there would, there would be more overlap, sure, but yeah. um, you would still have that problem. The, yeah, no, it's, um, and you're absolutely right. At some point, you have to turn off using the old key. And, yes. And um, you mentioned the GitHub research. Um, there's an, an enormous amount of craft, dead bodies on GitHub. We've seen, um, um, I can give you an, a nice example. Part of the 2000 that you saw, these are 2000 files, not 2000 repositories. Correct. So there are 1100 repositories, um, but um, in the end, there are 300 unique files on GitHub. So these are distinctly different from each other. Um, the 300 are in the long tail. In the, in the, in the, in the short tail, there is, um, as an example, dnsec underscore chain underscore validator.cc, um, which is in a very popular repository, Chromium. However, this was taken out of Chromium uh, about six years ago. And so, but these things get copied and forked and cloned on GitHub, so there's a lot of stuff of that. OpenWRT is another example. OpenWRT is, is um, um, what you see, OpenWRT, you can download that, install it, and then you can get a config overlay from, um, from GitHub. And you see a lot of old keys in there. What you also see a lot, as in all of them, they have DNSSEC disabled by default. Now, of course, what people do after you install it and download the configuration, we don't know what people do after that. They might enable, configure, uh, the, enable DNSSEC and then you might have a problem. Um, but yeah, good work. Um, 
Um, hopefully you find more stuff. <laughs> and, um, well, the point of this talk is more, you know, what we should do within the IETF and lessons learned, but, but yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Davey? Hi, Davey. Hello, Wales. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation, for the uh, merriment, and also I'm feeling, I have a feeling that maybe people are only aware the announcement that I can delay the KSK role, but not aware that a tons of work to be done <laughs> behind. So really thank you for the uh, sharing. And I come up with two I idea, or um, one is that uh, I heard that there is a wing group uh, or, or, or research group uh, called SUIT. I just heard it yesterday, and that it's about the update of the IoT devices. I think it's a similar problem that yeah. DS currently, the software, is, there is no update or protocol to support the to, to compliance with the protocol, right? Or rover as a case. So I'm thinking about if there any maybe potential work can be done or any discussion already happened. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the Internet of Things issue is much wider than DNS, right? They have <laughs> how many trust anchor bootstrapping issues do they have? And, and the fact that, that users don't update firmware, for example, once they buy a little modem. And, you know, if we don't get automatic updates and, you know, turned on for that, how, do, how are they going to eventually get new HTTPS certificates or whatever protocols they're making use of, management protocols or anything? Um, that has to be dealt with. It's not just a DNS specific problem for, especially for those widely deployed, very small devices. Okay. The second idea is that I once proposed a, a, a small draft uh, on the KSQ role team and about the comparison and analyze of how, uh, how the rover is so difficult because I compare the transition process compared to IPv6 transition and HTTPS transition, and I, we, I find that there is no such transition period for the KSK role. We just uh, choose a flag day and to stop signing. So that will trouble, that, that, that's the case. That's the reason I think, in my mind, uh, the best, uh, the, the, the most uh, 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 key difference between the different technology change. So I'm, uh, propose a very <laughs> intuitive idea. And uh, I think maybe after the case care over uh, performed in this year, the August, right? Uh, October. 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 Uh, I think there is more, there are more challenge work when people uh, uh, think about the, the, the algorithm role because maybe the uh, capability to roll the algorithm may be more difficult for the key. So I'm, um, I'm still thinking about the maybe some dual stack uh, or backward compatibility uh, uh, compatible uh, way of key key role or algorithm role can be developed later. Um, I, I, I ask you if you have any. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean I, I I appreciate the question, and in particular. Um, I mean, Roy is 100% right that at some point you have to remove the old key, so double signatures don't help you. The one thing that it does help is it allows you to have it a longer extension where you publish the, a newer yeah. key, which we've already done, right, with, with this. And so I would argue that the biggest lesson learned for me was that the three-month window last year from July to October was too short mm -hmm. um, and that we really needed a longer window, both for measurement and analysis as well as to make sure that, that validators out in the world really did get updated. Sometimes there are some slow rollout paths. Um, now that it's been a year and, and a month, well, I don't think, you know, it, it would have been nice if we could double sign for a year so that that rollout could continue and yet we could use the new key. But, um, yeah. you know, that we do, there is some thinking that needs to be done after after the key roll really finishes in next year when it, when the old key is actually removed and signed as revoked. But thanks for your question. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, that's the end of the session. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, Magnus was so kind and, and scribed today and there was a little bit more discussion than usually, so it was actually an effort. <laughs> but thank you so much for having the discussion here. That was great. And then see you next time.
and it's not that easy to do anything. Um, so actually, I don't think in our groups. No, no, in the group of my professor, I don't think we have to stop it. Yeah, exactly. But I also don't know if it's a good idea.